broadcasting from the spooky south coast and around the world on Midnight.fm. This is Midnight Society. I am your host, Tim Weisberg. Whether it is the brightest of day or the darkest of night, wherever you may be, it's time to hunker down for the next three hours as we enter into a world of wonder and weird that you won't hear anywhere else. And tonight... It's all about living long and prospering. Tonight we're going to be talking to what I like to call the real next generation of Star Trek with our guest Adam Nimoy, who will be joining us throughout the program. And then later on we'll be joined by Rod Roddenberry. You know them as the sons of the legends from Star Trek, Leonard Nimoy, who played Mr. Spock, and Gene Roddenberry, who created the series and devised the entire Star Trek universe. Well... Both of these gentlemen are also creative artists in their own right. We're going to talk to them not only about the world of Star Trek and the legacy of Star Trek, but also about their own work as well. And the important part, they want to hear from you. We'll be taking your questions, your thoughts, your comments, your memories at 508-322-1985. That's 508-322-1985. You can also Skype us directly at midnight.fm. So if you go to Skype and you type in midnight and then the period and then the FM, there might be a couple of choices that show up because there's some other Skype accounts that have similar names. You're looking for probably the first one. It has an M and a little period there. And then you'll know that that's midnight.fm. And you can Skype us directly. Just know that if you send a connection request, I, I can't accept it because then it will ring whenever you try to call. I can't turn that noise off from friends. I don't know why, so I don't accept any friend requests from anybody on Skype, but you can still Skype us directly if you want to do so. Also, you can email me, tim at midnight.fm. You can post in our Midnight Society Facebook group. Tracy does a great job running that group for us. Uh, And, of course, we have everybody in there during the show thread each and every day. Before the show starts, hours before the show starts, Tracy puts up all that information so that you can get in there and start the discussion well ahead of showtime. And we will also pull questions and thoughts and comments from in there as well throughout the night. But I want to say hi to everybody that's listening to us for the first time. Welcome aboard. We talk about all kinds of things here on Midnight Society. I like to think of this program as anything that you'd want to hear for a three-hour long-form interview late at night. And I know for some of you it's not that late at night. I know for some of you it's just the beginning of your evening, and some of you around the world it could be the middle of your day. But we like to say here at Midnight.fm, it's always midnight, and it always feels like late-night talk radio. That's what it's all about here. And speaking of late-night talk radio, today if you sign up for the telepath letter from one of our broadcast partners, the Paranormal Radio app, If you get that newsletter, you'll have gotten my new column in today's telepath in which I wrote about, well, last week, you know, was the the birthday of the master himself, the legendary Art Bell. It would have been his 75th birthday uh, on the 17th, and a lot of people were paying tribute to him. A lot of other radio shows were paying tribute to him. We kind of, you know, kept on with our, our regularly scheduled program, but I wanted to write a little something about not just art, but also about the legacy of paranormal radio in general. And so uh, if you read that column, I talked about how it all really started with Harry Price, in my opinion. Harry Price, the legendary ghost hunter who first started uh, having live broadcasts of his ghost hunts from the Borley Rectory in the UK. That led to Frank Edwards, the man who started talking about UFOs on the radio back in 1950, and, of course, uh, that led to the Long John Nebel program, which began in, in 1954. So it's entirely possible that a young Art Bell was laying in his bed with a, probably one of the first transistor radios, because they only came out in 54, lying under the covers, listening to people like Frank Edwards and Long John Nebel, inspiring what would later become Coast to Coast AM and then every other incarnation of Art Bell after that, and then, of course, that gave birth to shows such as this, because one one thread of the legacy always gives birth to another thread of the legacy, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight with our guests. And let's not waste any more time. Let's get right into it. Our first guest, Adam Nimoy, is the son of the late Leonard Nimoy, author, director. He began his work in the entertainment industry as an attorney in entertainment law, specializing in music and music publishing. 
He has also directed numerous films and television shows, including, which we'll be talking about quite a bit tonight, For the Love of Spock and Star Trek The Next Generation, and he joins us here on Midnight Society. Good evening, Adam. How are you? I'm doing well, Tim. How are you? Uh, doing very well and, and very honored to have you here. I, I think our audience here uh, on this program, maybe even more than any other late night show, are huge Star Trek fans, and they love any part of Star Trek that we can discuss. And I like the fact that, you know, we were talking tonight about the fact that it's it's more than just a television show. It's more than just an entertainment property. It's a way of life for a lot of people. Well, yeah, it's quite a culture. It's been become quite a phenomenon over the past 50 years uh, with the spin-off movies, the spin-off series, uh, the conventions. Um, it's been quite a wild ride, actually, for all of us. And so kind of... Give us an idea of when it first came into your consciousness. You know, uh, obviously, you know, your dad being who he was, you had a little bit of a different perspective on it than the rest of us did. Well, yeah, uh, I was just uh, thinking about this and writing about this, uh, about my first encounter with Spock uh, actually happened in uh, the winter of 1964. They were shooting the first Star Trek pilot. And uh, I was uh, uh, eight years old at the time, and I was an avid TV watcher. And and Dad came home with these Polaroids uh, that they took of him uh, with his wardrobe and makeup on, front and back pictures of Spock, the early Spock, the early version of Spock from that first pilot. And uh, that it made quite an impression on me. It was like I was like very, you know, I was very impressionable as a young kid. And it's one of those moments that I I just wanted to hold on to for the rest of my life because it was so exciting uh, to see him play such an interesting otherworldly character. And uh, and then it was it was quite a while later. It was that was the fall of winter of '64. It wasn't until the summer of of '66 that they really started shooting uh, that first season. So um, uh, quite some time had passed between them. Uh, it was a very exciting time, even before it aired. Uh, it was a lot of excitement about the show and hanging around the sets and, and watching them uh, shoot the series. Uh, and also, uh, I mean, it must have been pretty interesting to have your father playing this alien character or half alien character uh, and, and showing you what the design was going to be for that. Because I know the, it wasn't the early design a little bit different. The eyebrows were different and it kind of had a different look to the Spock character. Yeah, uh, much more primitive. As as Dad says in our in our documentary for the love of Spock, he didn't have a cool look as Spock when he first started. His uh, his hair was kind of jaggedly cut. His eyebrows weren't as refined. Um, they really didn't they didn't have it uh, a, a real uh, crafted look that he ended up having with Fred Phillips, the makeup artist who was there from the very beginning. Well. Well, all of the pre-production was going on and, and, and things were starting to get ready for the series. Did they have an idea of what the character was going to be like then? Well, yeah. I mean, originally, uh, uh, Gene Roddenberry, who had conceived the character, I think he had a, a pretty good idea. Uh, he had a very general idea of what the character was going to be. But the most profound uh, element was this idea that he was going to be half alien, half human. Um, which my father was very thankful for because it gave him something to play, that there was this kind of conflict, inner conflict going on between uh, trying to assimilate with the rest of the crew and, and being uh, a, a contributing member uh, of the crew of the, of the Starship Enterprise and yet still being something different uh, and otherworldly. And so they just created a lot of a quite, a di- what, as Dad would say, a dynamic inner life for the character. Um, and these were, th- this was the, the basic concept that Gene had to begin with, as well as the pointed ears. I mean, you know, there's a lot of, uh, again, Dad talks about this in, in the documentary about the fact that they could not get the ears right. It was, there was so much, so many complications, so much trouble trying to get something that looked appropriate and not comical. And, and Dad went to Gene and said, I don't think it's going to work. And Gene said, keep, don't give up, just keep trying to make it happen. And, and and they finally did. But after these initial uh, general concepts that Gene had, then there was a lot of development of the character on set with directors. And then and the writers seeing how the character was developing and the relationship between Spock and Kirk and McCoy, uh, the writers were picking up on that and writing for that and developing the character based on what they were doing uh, between the actors. So 
it was a long kind of uh, organic evolving process. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I, I wasn't around then, so uh, I'm, I'm not totally sure if this is true, but I would un- I would think that there hadn't been a lot of alien characters to that point that had been, you know, the hero or had been in a, in a good guy role that for the most part, the aliens were usually the antagonist. Uh, yeah, I mean, my, I, 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 it's a little early for, for my age as well, but I mean, there was uh, Outer Limits, uh, uh, alien characters on Outer Limits. There was uh, uh, zombies from the stratosphere, uh, Commander Cody, which uh, Leonard Nimoy guest starred in. Um, I don't recall that there was – my favorite Martian, obviously, yeah. uh, 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 was the hero of that show. So um, it was just – there were a lot of elements that were in place at that time that sort of appealed to people. There was – it was a, unique a, a compared to all the other TV that was on the air. Um, it was in color, and they really pushed the color palette of that show. It was the first season – when every major network, their entire primetime lineup was in color for the first time ever. That was the fall of 1966. Uh, so there were, yes, there were a lot of things that caught people's attention. And um, although people were, were not sure of what to make of the show, this is the thing that whether or not it was going to be goofy, uh, you know, and kind of uh, outer space opera or something more serious. And there were some goofy elements to Star Trek, but the, the key players and the writing was, for the most part, various serious science fiction, which was cloaking the social issues of the day within the context of science fiction. And I think after, after the first few episodes, um, most of the, the intelligentsia, the sci-fi fans who were watching were hooked. And, and, and was that something that your father was aware of from the beginning, that it was working in these social themes? I mean, I, you don't really have to read too deep into the scripts to realize that a lot of those stories are allegories for what was going on in America at the time. Well, this was the big issue. I mean, this is what drove Gene Roddenberry uh, in part to write in that genre, because he was trying to write social issues and getting a lot of uh, flack for it. And, um, you know, I mean, and NBC apparently had this this kind of mantra that, uh, that social issues are for the uh, news department, and this is entertainment, and they should be kept separate. Uh, I, it, I think Roddenberry was trying to uh, play off of uh, using the sci-fi genre to cloak these issues of the day that were of concern to him. Uh, so that was his motivation. And also my dad was concerned, he said this early on, of he had a serious acting career, and he was worried that this was going to be uh, this is going to be uh, like a circus and he would not be taken seriously. It was a big concern of, of his. And in fact, we have him in, uh, in For the Love of Spock, we have his good friend, Barry Newman, uh, a childhood friend who was a, a fabulous actor in his own right, telling my dad, uh, you got to get out of this before it even aired because he was concerned uh, that it wouldn't be taken seriously. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I can kind of understand the mindset about that. You know, when you're, when you're trying to make your way as an actor, you're, you're concerned about the way that things are going to be perceived. But also as you're, you know, as you're reading these characters and reading some of these scripts that are coming out, you have to realize that, you know, a lot of this is it, it, some of the best drama that was probably on television at the time. Because although it had the gimmick, although it had the hook of being out there in space, they were very humanistic stories. Well, they were. I mean, this is the interesting thing for me is that, you know, some sometimes Star Trek could get hokey. This is the thing. And and it could be laughable. But the critical part was it was a collaborative effort. There was some excellent writing. And uh, DeForest Kelly and Bill Shatner and Leonard Nimoy really knew their stuff when they got there. These guys were pros and they played it very seriously and straight. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, Leonard was a straight man against uh, against DeForest and, and Bill. Uh, so they there was room to play. But there was a lot of stuff that was very serious, um, very challenging uh, uh, episodes about uh, current issues, about issues of, uh, you know, social issues and race issues and political issues and and issues about war and peace. And I mean, there was a lot of the. They tackled. It was a very ambitious show. They tackled a lot, um, and those guys, I think, really had the chops to pull it off. Dad had a lot of experience in TV uh, when he got there. He was at the right place at the right time. Bill had experience in, in film, as did D. Kelly. 
Uh, and, and it was the chemistry between the three of them uh, that just really made it play that the whole idea of this uh, integrated cast uh, with, with uh, you know, uh, a checkup and Sulu and Uhura and um, really, really gave it a whole uh, international feel to it, an integrated feel to it. it was, and it was timely in that respect in terms of uh, uh, the social movement of the day. Uh, there were a lot of things going for it that fell into place in a, in, at the right place at the right time. And I'm sure you get asked this question all the time, so I apologize for asking what's probably the the thing you get asked the most, but how much like your father was the Spock character? Because he's he's playing this character, uh, but at the same time, you know, he's trying to bring it, – it, it's very hard It's very hard to bring emotion to a character that's supposed to be emotionless, but yet he succeeded in doing so. Yeah, I, well, I mean, I think I think Dad would say that Spock had a lot of emotions. They were just um, – that he was struggling to maintain them within himself. Uh, there was a struggle not to express himself emotionally, uh, but he was had a lot of feeling. There was a lot of internal life going on, uh, which is, I think, a really interesting part of the character. And you see it in him. I mean, with the close-ups, with the eyebrow, uh, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it was very, it was a weird period for for us at home. It was a very interesting part time of our lives because. Uh, for the first time in his career, he had a full-time job, for one thing, uh, and he was in character a lot. I mean, that was a lot of who my dad was, and, and he came by it honestly. I mean, his father was a man of very few words uh, and emotion. Uh, it was his mother who ran the show. Um, but uh, uh, I think he, a lot of there was a lot of Leonard in the Spock character, there's no doubt about it. Um, and uh, sometimes during those years, three years of formative years really for me uh it was hard to relate to him hard to get through to him it's very exhausting work tim as well i mean uh very long days and they're shooting a lot of uh of pages uh during the day and very you know i uh, had to be in early for makeup early in the morning um and uh come home at night learn his lines eat his dinner and go to bed so uh and then from there, Dad went right into Mission Impossible for two years, also uh, heavy makeup changes for him uh, in, that, in those episodes as well. So uh, I think there was a lot of Dad and Spock, definitely. Dad, sometimes it was hard to know what he was thinking. Well, I also think people don't really understand now, because if you look at the way that people create sci-fi now, you know, the actors go, they do their job, they perform what they need to perform, and then all of the effects are added in afterwards and they put everything in with computers. So all you need to get is that, you know, that performance and then everybody else takes care of the magic after the fact. But with something like Star Trek at that time, you know, everything's practical effects. So they probably had to, you know, shoot and reshoot. Something didn't work. Something went wrong. They needed to get something else a different way. So it was probably far more grueling to, to have to shoot some of the things that were done in that series than maybe any sci-fi that came after it. Well, it was, it, for its time, it was a complicated show. It was definitely pushing the limit. Um, in fact, when uh, the whole concept of Star Trek was uh, discussed at the studio at Desi Lu, uh, run at the time by Lucille Ball, uh, the, the financial guys at the studio said to her, we shouldn't be doing it because it's going to be too expensive. There's going to be too many cost overruns. And uh, she greenlit the project anyway. I mean, I, I, you know, I think it's very interesting that, you know, that Lucy Ricardo had such a, uh, a pivotal role in Star Trek history. She is the one who greenlit the pilot for, uh, for the series. So, uh, and there were cost overruns. It was a very complicated show to make and a very expensive show to make. And they, they had a lot of trouble with uh, the special effects, uh, getting them in on time. Uh, it was a very difficult period for everybody. And and one thing that I had never known of, about your father was uh, it, it happened to me when I was maybe you know fourteen years old or twelve years old or something. I went to the uh, to the Muger Omni Theater at the Museum of Science in Boston, and no, it was the I think it was it was yeah the Omni Theater, the one where you can see this yeah. the big screen. And right before the the whole thing starts, they have an introduction that kind of explains to you what you're about to see because this is before they had had the Omni Theaters and. Here's this voice of Leonard Nimoy talking to the crowd and saying, you know, hey, I grew up right down the street from here. And I had had no idea to that point that he was actually from Boston. 
Uh, yeah, I uh, grew up, born and grew up in the West End of Boston, uh, which was um, a section that was populated by immigrants. Uh, many uh, Russians were there, uh, as were my grandparents. They were Russian immigrants. There were uh, Irish were there. There were Italians there, all mingling together uh, in, a, in a small, uh, very quaint neighborhood, uh, which was completely demolished in the 50s for what they called urban renewal. I mean, it was, uh, the West End was a pretty special place. It was, it was a beautiful piece of real estate in Boston, which is probably why they moved all the immigrants out of it. Uh, it was just close to the Charles River. You could walk to the Bandshell. You could walk to the Boston Garden. You could walk to uh, the Boston Common. Uh, I mean, I, I was back there with my dad, in fact, in 2013. We were uh, shooting a documentary about his early life growing up there, and it had a huge influence on him. Um, he, he talked about the fact that it had a huge influence on his character because the fact of the matter is for him, Spock was the only one on the, on the, the core crew of the bridge of the enterprise who was not all human. And, uh, for him, the whole, uh, arc of the show was how he could integrate with the rest of the, the crew. And that was very much reflective of his experience growing up as in, as the son of immigrants is how to assimilate himself into the bigger society, which is why he wanted to get out of the West End uh, and left at age 18 and got on a train, a three-day train ride to come out to, to California. Uh, so, um, and there, were a lot, there was a lot that happened in the West End that had uh, a big influence on his life. Uh, there was the Elizabeth Peabody Playhouse there, which was a halfway house sort of to help immigrants transition into American society. And they had a theater there and that's where dad, in fact, got the bug to become an actor at a very early age. And, and was it, is it true that it was actually, um, it was his musical ability that really started to get him noticed in, in the early days as a, as a young kid? His musical ability? Yeah. That it, uh, well, it, I, I'm not sure about that. I, I will say that when my dad told his father that he wanted to become an actor, uh, my grandfather suggested that he should learn the accordion because uh, you can always make money as a, accordion player uh well you know look leonard nimoy cut a bunch of records and he loved to sing and his musical theater was excellent some some of the the recordings i, I must say are um a little bit on the fence of uh, of uh, uh whether or not they're listenable and some of it is is excellent in my opinion i love some of the stuff that he that he recorded um, you know, I mean, not really as a young kid, but he uh, was he really, interestingly enough, grew into the musical theater because he did uh, Fiddler on the Roof, Summer Stock on the East Coast, beginning at the North Shore Theater in Beverly, Massachusetts. And then we traveled around for a while and he was phenomenal in that. He was phenomenal in Camelot. Uh, he was in Oliver. Uh, you know, he, he did have a, have a musical sensibility, but that was not the way he was originally trained or raised. Well, we're going to take our first break here uh, coming up in just a moment. When we come back on the other side of it, I want to dive into the decision to put together For the Love of Spock and, and how you went down that road. And I think uh, what we'll find out is, you know, as we go along with the discussion here tonight, we're 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 telling the story of not only the character, but the man behind the character and the, the way that you grew up in kind of, you know, I don't want to say the shadow of Spock, but certainly, you know, having that be a big part of your life. So we'll continue on with that as we go along. If people want to call in with any questions, 508-322-1985 is the number. That's 508-322-1985. You can also Skype us directly at midnight.fm. You can email me, tim at midnight.fm, if you would rather send things in in written form. There's the Facebook group, the Midnight Society with Tim Weisberg Facebook group that Tracy has started the show thread there pinned right to the top of the page. If you would like to put questions in there, uh, for if you remember, we have the Discord server and also you can tweet me. I know a lot of you out there might not even be on Facebook, especially some folks listening for the first time tonight. You can tweet me directly at Tim Weisberg and you'll be able to send your questions in that way. So there's a lot of windows open on my computer, a lot of ways that uh, you can reach out and get in touch with us and be become part of the program. But the best way, the best way is to call in and talk directly to our guest, Adam Nimoy. And then a little bit later on, we'll also be joined by Rod Roddenberry as we are talking about Star Trek. We are talking about the legacy of Star Trek, and we'll talk more about it when we return with more Midnight Society here on Midnight.fm.
this show. Dial 508-322-1985. That's 508-322-1985. Or Skype midnight.fm. Welcome back into Midnight Society here on Midnight.fm. Tonight, it's all about Star Trek, and our guest right now is director and son of Mr. Spock himself, Leonard Nimoy. Adam Nimoy is here with us, and we are talking about the, well, growing up with Mr. Spock as your dad, but also we'll be talking about the new movie For the Love of Spock, a documentary covering Leonard Nimoy's life as an actor and the popularity of his most famous character. But Adam, your, yourself, how did you get involved in the entertainment industry? As we said in, in the in the bio at the beginning, you actually started off as an entertainment lawyer. Yes, that is correct. Uh, I did, uh, oddly enough. Um, well, you know, Tim, uh, a lot of times we try to, as sons of successful people, uh, you know, create our own path and blaze our own trail, as it were. Uh, I wanted to do something that uh, my dad could not do. I wanted to differentiate myself from him. Uh, and by going to law school, I, w- I did pretty well in school. Dad was not a school-oriented kind of guy. And uh, I wanted to stay in school and get a postgraduate degree. Uh, I always intended to go to law. His parents were, were just beside themselves, my grandparents, because they, that's what they wanted from my dad. Uh, that was their idea of the American dream. And... Uh, and uh, just it, it was of interest to me. And I practiced law for about seven years in the music industry, mostly. Uh, but uh, after a while, it, for a number of reasons and circumstances, it became clear to me that it was not something that I really wanted to do for the rest of my life. Uh, it's something that we I talk about a little bit in terms of my story with my dad in For the Love and Spock uh, about my desire to transition out and do something more creative and, and, and ending up to be more like him, frankly, uh, in, in terms of his directing career, I, I had no interest in being in front of the camera. Uh, one actor in the family was more than enough, but uh, I was interested in what was going on behind the camera. And, and so uh, I was lucky that uh, Dad introduced me to uh, the producers on The Next Generation, and I was able to observe there for a, a full season uh, to start and take classes at UCLA Extension and, and whatnot, and private classes to get up to speed as to what the directing was all about. Yeah, and that's something that I think is, you know, uh, it's a nice, it's a nice end to have, but you can't, people take a look at things like that and they say, oh, well, you know, it helps to have a famous father, right? But that's not the kind of job that you keep if you have a famous father. You know, that might get your foot in the door and get you to sit there and shadow a season of Star Trek, but you have to have the ability and the eye and the management skill and everything that's involved in directing to be able to, to, to keep that job. Nobody's, nobody's hiring you based on your last name. Once it comes time to actually become a director. Well, I, I, I can only say from my own personal experience that I worked very hard uh, to create a directing career for myself and, uh, and was able to do so for about 10 years and then other circumstances forced to change in my life. But, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that is true. It's not, uh, look, Hollywood is a highly, and, and, as are many industries, it's highly nepotistic, and it will get your foot in the door, but <clears throat> you do have to prove yourself. Um, I think my daughter is a case in point. She's now working as a, a production executive in the TV division over at Paramount, where they shot Star Trek. And, um, and she uh, really had to prove herself there, and, she, and she's been there for quite a while and very successful there, but... It is hard work because people have certain expectations of you um, and uh, you want to uh, kind of, you know, d- that you're privileged and that's how you got in through your connections. And I think I, I work very hard to defy those expectations. You just make my own way. I was very uh, intent on doing the work. I was very uh, challenged by the work and I was very excited by the work. This is this is Leonard's whole mantra is that you have to have passion about what you do, which I did not have about practicing law. But I did about about being in the collaborative process of filmmaking. And uh, and so, um, you know, I did I had a pretty good long run, uh, 10 seasons in network TV. And um, it was uh, there were a lot of ups and downs. It's very challenging. It's very difficult work. Um, But I'm I'm teaching film to this day and it still excites me. And I remember in in the eighties, you know, when when Leonard Nimoy was directing films, you know, uh, I think a couple of the Star Trek films, Three Men and a Baby. I mean, these are these are big Hollywood movies, 
and and it must have shown you that there is a lot that comes with the role of being a director that there's more to it than just you know with an actor you show up and you're worried about your your bringing your own best performance and how you can interrelate with the other actors but when you're a director everything falls on your shoulders well uh yeah um <laughs> in tv it's interesting uh a, a, a fellow director a friend of mine once said that you have a lot of response you have a, a lot of responsibility and no authority in television as a director <laughs> Uh, yeah, because it all falls on you. It does. I mean, you're responsible for a, um, uh, it's a huge workload to work with the writers, to, uh, prep the material, uh, to work with the department heads, to work with the casting director, the art director, the director of photography, uh, collaborate with the actors. It's a very, it's, uh, it's a real art form in and of itself. And it takes, uh, a lot of, uh, conscientious work, a lot of focus. Uh, a lot of energy, a lot of time. Uh, it's very all consuming. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's challenging work, but it's also can be very rewarding work. My dad used to say that if you do your homework during the pre-production period, you should be able while you're in production to sit back and enjoy performances all day, uh, which is kind of like the treat at the end of it, uh, because it, the work is so hard, uh, and it is so challenging. And yes, you're responsible for, uh, a lot of different uh, elements that go into filmmaking. Oh, I can I can certainly understand that. That sounds like a great a great approach and a great way to look at it. That you know by then it's it's almost like if it's a live production. You know that by the time you are putting the show up on stage, everything's kind of just you know second nature, and now you're just enjoying the show, enjoying the 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 fruits of all the time that you've put in. So. Do, do you feel that that was the way that you were able to approach things, that you were able to actually let some of that pressure come away when it came time to let the cameras roll? Well, the the, the key, Tim, as I'm sure you know from personal experience, is experience, uh, frankly. I mean, when I started directing with The Next Generation, very challenging for me, very difficult. They were in, I think, season five at that point. It was like herding cats. They were just, things were out of control because they're a hit show and, they know what, you know, what they've got going and, um, and they need to be challenged. And it's, it gets much more, it's very difficult for a, a visiting director who comes in there. I mean, they shoot t- between 22 and 24, six episodes. I'm only there for one or two. I'm there for three weeks. You, you come and go as a guest director. So, uh, very challenging to come into that kind of atmosphere. It was only after having directed several episodes that, and, and actually making a short film in between where I finally got my sea legs and kind of understood what it's all about. And once you kind of understand the technique that goes into filmmaking, you really get a sense. And this is, these are the things that my father really in, instilled in me. And then I teach my students uh, when I teach uh, filmmaking, which is that it's story. And that's what Star Trek is so great about. It's story. It's all about story and theme and what it is you're trying to convey to your audience. Uh, and second from that, it's performance issues, is, is working and collaborating with actors to help get the best performances possible. And after that, thirdly, it's the technique. It's all the aspects of filmmaking that go in to capture that stuff on film. And once you kind of understand that and, and get, especially get the technique down and are comfortable about the filmmaking process, yes, then you can really get on set and really sometimes have fun and enjoy yourself. What was it like, you know, I, I know, of course, being the director, you're coming in with some some trepidation because you are the visiting director coming into an established show, but how did the cast and, and the crew of The Next Generation treat you uh, as you were coming in? Because here's somebody who is, you know, you've got a famous last name and, and part of this whole legacy that all that all, all that it entails. But I could also imagine, you know, there's some people that might have said, well, hey, listen, you know, you still got to prove yourself here, kid. Well, I had been with <laughs> it's a good question, uh, Tim. I had been with the next generation for a full season, getting to know them and hanging out and watching them and trying to see how they worked and what their process was and what the rhythm of the day was like. And, and did they, uh, they knew who you were at that time when you were shadowing? I'm sorry? They knew who you were when you were shadowing? Oh, yeah. They okay. knew who I was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I and I tried to get to know them personally. And um, I really worked hard to study under the cinematographer who really ran the set, uh, who took me under his wing and um, – really got to know the crew very well. And, and it was just, a, it was a great educational experience. I was very lucky. It was very fortunate 
it's hard to get these uh, apprenticeships. They're, they're, they're basically called observers and on the set because they don't want a bunch of extraneous people there. It's just the work is too hard. Uh, they were very welcoming to me when I was there observing much more challenging when we actually had to make the shows very, very challenging uh, to do the work again, because uh, it's exhausting work. And after five seasons, uh, they're looking for new challenges. Um, I'm just trying to figure stuff out as I go along. Uh, those people are like family to me now. I mean, I love them. They're such good people. Um, but it would be difficult for anybody in that position to be there as a first time director. And, and sometimes they would test me and challenge me. These are things that I, I, they were important for me to learn, frankly, because that is the way it is on most shows. People want to see what you're made of. They want to, they want to be convinced that you have the right stuff to do the job you're doing. And uh, it was shaky for me to begin with, with those guys, but it was a very, really, you know, there's a big learning curve. Uh, but after that, as I had more shows under my belt, I got, I became more uh, confident in the work I was doing. And, and what would you say was probably the, the biggest challenge that you faced in that? I mean, as, I'm thinking about all the different parts involved with a production like that, which, you know, even from the outset, it was coming in as being just as good sci-fi as anything that you would see on a big screen when it came to all the effects and everything that was being put into place, but also having such a great cast and, and such fantastic performances. I mean, was it hard to find that balance? What, what was the real big challenges of directing a Star Trek show like that? Well, I think that the challenge, I, I think, in directing that in any show is just the sheer, uh, the sheer uh, challenge of uh, sustaining your energy. And because the hours are so long, I mean, sometimes we would wrap on shows at two o'clock in the morning and have to be back there, uh, you know, 12 hour turnaround and start all over again for a 12 to 14 hour day. It's very physically challenging uh, to direct these shows. Uh, uh, for directors and the cast, um, it is, it is, you, you just, your, your mind is numb after a while. I mean, when you're on these shows, dad would tell me and, and the cast on the next generation felt the same way. It's just a blur. There's so many pages they have to memorize and get through that they really cannot get deep into the material. Sometimes, uh, they just have to, they, they just have to get through the day. So I think the, the big, the biggest challenge is to over is to try to stay ahead of the, of the game in terms of, uh, the stamina that's required to keep you and, and to, to keep you on your game. Uh, because when the cameras are rolling, you have to, the, the focus is just, everything comes down to what is happening in front of the camera. Uh, and, and just, I, I like to te tell my students, just as you are, you're tired, you are really hungry and you could really use a, a restroom break. That is when the assistant director says, roll camera. And it, and it, you have to pull it all together and be focused on what is happening uh, because a lot of people are relying on you to get as the best material you can on film. And and now that led for you to a, a long career in, in television directing. Uh, is it, was your first kind of feature length thing or, or your first thing kind of away from series television? Was it the Leonard Nimoy's Boston special? Cause I remember seeing that on channel two in Boston. Yeah. Uh, we, that was, uh, uh, really the first kind of uh, long form independent thing I had made. Um, I made a short film uh, after I directed the next generation, uh, which really helped me develop my directing skills. Uh, yeah, that was kind of an independent project that I put together with dad. We wanted to, we were very close. This is, this is just a couple of years before he died actually. And my dad and I had a very tumultuous relationship, much of which we explore in for the love of Spock. And um, we were very close at that point in his life. And I, it was my idea, really. I wanted to go back to Boston with him, hire a camera crew, and, uh, and just together, you know, walk around town and, and have him reminisce about his experiences growing up in Boston. It's such an incredible, vibrant, dynamic city. Uh, I've always loved Boston. I used to go back during the summers to visit his parents who lived there until the early eighties. So, um, and when I was in college and, uh, in the seventies, I would always go back during the summer. So it was kind of my idea to, to, uh, to work on a, an independent project, uh, of my own conception, um, and to work with dad and to bond with him really, uh, and to, uh, and to be in his hometown and for him to bookend his life and look back at his life because the trajectory of where this guy had come from, and where he ended up was was just uh, astronomical, so to speak. 
I mean, this is a, a kid from a, you know humble beginnings in the in an immigrant neighborhood in the West End of Boston, uh, who who be, became such a you know was a part of such an international phenomenon on Star Trek worldwide with millions of fans. So um, we sort of wanted to kind of take a look back at where it all began. And 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 really, I mean, to me, it was as somebody who was born in Boston and has always kind of lived outside the Boston area. It was great to see that perspective of it and does you know because my you know my grandparents lived in there you know but they didn't really give me kind of the whole history of it of what it was like at that time so it was it was great to kind of see that and and experience that through through your father's eyes and and so that kind of led up to having the the documentary chops to be able to uh create for the love of spock well yeah it was the beginning uh the, the project went off well it was a small project this leonard nimoy's boston that we did um but um, we had a lot of fun working on it together. And in between uh, my teaching gig, I thought that we should figure out a way to help celebrate 50 years of uh, Star Trek, the original series. And the idea I had was to make a documentary with that. Um, first and foremost about Spock, the, you know, the, the birth of Spock, the evolution of Spock, the impact of Spock on, on culture and and uh, societies all over the world. And it was something that my dad, you know, jumped at the uh, the opportunity right away. He wanted, he was in and wanted to do that so much so that he, the second meeting that we had together, he had been doing some uh, research on Google. He Googled Spock's ears and came back with a hundred and over a hundred thousand, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 references to Spock's ears, which, <laughs> which kind of tickled him, you know, um, that's really where the, the whole idea kind of uh, germinated was when we were working on the, the Boston documentary. And, and so as you're going forward and looking into that and, and deciding, you know, how you want to cover the character, I'm, I'm assuming that that means, you know, that your, your father as a person has to play a big role in that as well. But how did you come up with the idea of working your own relationship with him into the film? Well, that really all happened after my father passed away. I mean, we were working on the film. It was uh, right around November of uh, 2014. And that's when dad reminded me we were at the 50th anniversary of that first pilot. They started shooting and and just uh, after Thanksgiving in 1964. Um, And then uh, dad passed away in February of 2015, just a few months later. So um, we, you know, we had the produce the production team in place and we were all set to go when dad passed away. And, and after, you know, the, the process of mourning and, and the transition of dealing with life without my father, uh, which was pretty phenomenal actually, because there's so much, uh, such an outpouring, a wave of emotion from people about the loss of Leonard Nimoy. Uh, and that's when it became to clear to us, the filmmakers, that this this is not going to be just a Spock film. This is the thing, t- uh, Tim, that's so interesting is that Dad did not want it to be the Leonard Nimoy show. He really wanted this documentary to be about Spock and only about Spock. But it became clear after he died that it really needed to be about Spock and about Leonard Nimoy, uh, the life of, of the man who played Spock. Uh, and that was going to be our, our B story. And it was in the process of, of pulling things together and working the film that more and more people involved with the film kept saying, I should add this third element of the film, which would make it really unique, which was my own story of, of the, the you know, the trials and tribula- tribulations, tribulations, as they say in <laughs> Space Nine, um, of, of, of uh, my relationship with my dad, uh, which was something I wasn't sure about, but there was so much such a, a chorus of people who thought we should really work this in as this as the C story, the third story, because I think that would they, they felt that it would appeal to people to see to really humanize what my experience was uh, through the years of uh, being the son of Leonard Nimoy and 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 as you said in the shadow of Spock and Star Trek. And and we'll certainly dive into that uh, throughout our discussion too. But just taking a step back for a moment, you know, you said that your father really wanted to have it be about the character. And I know that there's always been kind of this perception, especially after writing the book, I Am Not Spock, there was kind of this perception that he had been rejecting the character with that. But in actuality, it was, from my understanding, just kind of, you know, explaining the differences and, and, and just letting people know that Leonard Nimoy was a separate person than the character of Spock and that it, that he in no way was trying to reject the Spock character at all. Tim, you have really done your homework. That's, that's amazing. 
Uh, I really appreciate that because that is exactly right on. Uh, The problem is the fans didn't quite get that, or many fans didn't quite get that. And he was, he, uh, they took him to task for the title of that particular book, but that really was it. He was just trying to say there, Spock is, is a a personality in and of himself. My name is Leonard Nimoy. Uh, Nice to meet you. Uh, Because people were confusing him with the character, uh, you know, when he would meet them in, in, uh, uh, in person. So, um, that is true, uh, that that dad was trying to basically say that, that he's an artist who plays his character, that he loves the character, he respects the character, the character brought him a lot of opportunity, but, uh, but that there was a lot of other things that dad did uh, as an artist to challenge himself um, that were a step away from Star Trek, including the Mission Impossible years, and, and, the, and, the, and that book came out in the mid-70s when he was deep into this... Uh, this theater career that he really had always aspired to. Um, and that I think really helped him develop and, and evolve and challenged him as an artist. And then of course he writes the follow up 20 years later and calls it, I am Spock. So <laughs> yeah, that's his, that was his apology for the, I am not Spock. Um, uh, <laughs> debacle, um, debacle. Anyway. Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, he realized that it, it may have been a mistake because people misinterpreted what he was saying. And and he told me actually personally uh, one on one one time that the fans did not let up on him. They were very upset with him because there were some attempts to revive Star Trek, uh, and there was a lot of fear that that Leonard did not want to be in Star Trek again. And it was not until he signed on uh, to the first motion picture that they that he finally let let up on him and forgave him uh, once he put the years back on and, and reappeared in the motion pictures. Yeah, I think to me it was. Uh... When I was really young, it was probably in search of, and uh, there was a show on Nickelodeon, Standby, Lights, Camera, Action. Those were the two shows that I actually knew him from before I'd even seen an episode of Star Trek. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was very lucky that he had those. I mean, you know, the seventies were lean years in the beginning for everybody associated with Star Trek. Were was looking for work, uh, not the least of whom was Gene Roddenberry, and. Uh, I was just looking with Rod Roddenberry. In fact, we, we did a screening of his film, A Trek Nation, which talked a lot about uh, Gene's life in those early years after Star Trek because uh, people were looking for work. Uh, Dad was very fortunate. Uh, he, he fell into uh, in search of lights, camera, action, uh, the theater work. Uh, he, had, he was still uh, making records. Uh, you know, he was this was this was a, my uncle Bill, who's still alive and God bless him, would always say uh, you can take the boy, you can. You can take the boy out of Boston, but you cannot take Boston out of the boy. And uh, my dad was always that tough kid on the street corner of Boston who was hustling for a buck. Uh, he had odd jobs all his life as a kid, uh, selling newspapers, uh, working in a camera store, uh, selling vacuum cleaners. And when he came to L.A., same thing, a lot of odd jobs. He was just um, he, he really knew how to keep, you know, keep things moving and and find new ways of staying plugged in and staying employed and, and uh, saving his money. He was very frugal and uh, so many odd jobs that he had before Star Trek. It was actually very inspirational to me. Well, we are going to take our next break here coming up, and uh, we will continue on with our discussion with Adam Nimoy in the next segment. Also, a little bit later on, we'll be joined by the son of Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek. His son, Rod Roddenberry, will be joining us for the discussion. The phone lines will be open throughout the course of the night. You can call us 508 522-1985. Three two two nineteen eighty five. You can also email me, Tim, at midnight.fm. I see that we already have some questions that have been rolling in uh, on Facebook, in the Facebook group. We will work those in. I've also gotten some email questions as well. We will bring all of those to the table when we get back. And again, if you want to go to that Facebook group, it is called The Midnight Society with Tim Weisberg. It is run by our friend Tracy and some of her team there. And they do a great job of putting out all of this great information about the the show. Tracy's been furiously posting things all throughout the day. So if you go to the Facebook group, you'll see that show thread right at the top of the page. She pins it right to the top of the page each and every day. And she just drops all the relevant links in there. But... If you're not on Facebook and you want to find all that, the easiest place to go is midnight.fm. That is our website where you can always find all the information about our guests each and every day. And we have all of the bio info, the show information, all the relevant links to their websites, to their books, and anything else, all right there at midnight.fm. While you're there, 
Why not sign up and become a member? That will allow you to download all of our previous shows, including if you're a Star Trek fan. Uh, just last month, I had the opportunity to speak for an hour with Walter Koenig, who, of course, you know is Mr. Chekhov. What a what a great discussion that was. Oh, my God, I'm still remembering some of the stories that he was telling us. I felt like the, the Howard Stern of the paranormal that night when he told me he was still a virgin when he was 21. I was like, I didn't even ask about that. How did this come up? So you can check that out. Just become a member at midnight.fm. And that's where we'll be back in just a few moments with more Midnight Society as our night to Star Trek continues. Show dial 508 322 1985. That's 508 322 1985 or Skype midnight.fm. And welcome back into Midnight Society here on midnight.fm tonight. We are talking with Adam Nimoy a little bit later on. We'll be joined. By Rod Roddenberry, we're talking about the legacy of Star Trek. We're talking about, for the love of Spock right now, the documentary that was directed by our guest, Adam Nimoy, about his, about his dad, about the character of Spock, about their relationship together. And we'll be talking more about that, but I do want to bring in some of the questions, Adam, that the fans have been posting in the Facebook group and on sending in via the uh, um, emails and posting in the live show thread as well, uh, the uh, live video stream as well. And Randy says, you know, we've we've often heard the phrase that uh, Star Trek was pitched as wagon train to the stars, and and Leonard Nimoy actually had a lot of experience in westerns uh, in television, you know, d- doing episode four episodes of the actual wagon train, Bonanza, Gunsmoke, so Rawhide. He came into this, the Virginian. He came into this having experience with those westerns. Did he ever discuss that idea, the idea of bringing some of that Western sentimentality to what they were doing with Star Trek? Uh, well, uh, it's interesting. Uh, uh, no, sp- there is no sp- specific connection between the two. What, what's interesting is that, yes, Dad was in a lot of Westerns um, uh, and uh, oftentimes played Native Americans, interestingly enough. Uh, in Westerns, uh, it, 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 one of uh, dad's jokes was, uh, he was told by his agent, if a producer asks you if you can ride a horse, just say, yes, I can ride a horse. Uh, these were small parts that he did in a number of different TV shows. Uh, his last uh, guest starring role before they started shooting the regulars first season of Star Trek was actually in a Gunsmoke episode. And he uh, was told to report to, um, the Western costume company in uh, Los Angeles, very close, right next to the Paramount lot. And he took me with him. This is, uh, this is in 1966. And uh, uh, I waited for him while they took him in the back. And about 20 minutes later, he appeared as, as an Indian, uh, John walking Fox, I think is the character's name. Uh, And he just was phenomenal. I mean, he, he just looked phenomenal in the role. And I think they were just a part of this evolution as an actor. He always wanted to be a character actor. he, He loved Lon Chaney and the different roles that he could put on. You get some wardrobe together and some makeup together and you start to create a character. Uh, And I think a lot of those Westerns uh, uh, were uh, what, you know, enabled him to kind of fulfill that dream. So whether or not there's a direct connection from the Western experience to Star Trek and Spock, I, I, I think not. Uh, I I do think that uh, uh, Gene did have that sensibility of wanting an ensemble cast, however, and, uh, and and in that respect, I, I think he was trying to translate that into a sci-fi show. And, and you had mentioned the, you know, wanting to be a character actor and, and, and taking the acting part very seriously. Aaron wants to know if there was a particular acting technique that Leonard Nimoy studied and, and, and utilized. Well, uh, 
Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, well, it, well, uh, Leonard went to uh, came out to uh, the Pasadena Playhouse only to discover it was not as challenging as he had hoped it would be. Uh, and then he went to a uh, private class with a gentleman by the name of Jeff Corey. Now, uh, Jeff was teaching class in the 50s because he was on the blacklist and, and uh, was not able to find work in film or TV. Uh, it was, uh, uh, so dad was in his class and actually took over his class. And, and, you know, there was no, because I took class with Jeff. That was a part of my director's training. Uh, and, and Jeff's attitude was that everything works, uh, whether, you know, it, it's uh, method acting, uh, sense memory, uh, you know, wh- whatever, you know, uh, naturalism, just showing up and hitting your mark and, and, uh, and telling the truth, whatever works for you works. You, you pick and choose. There was nothing specific really, uh, when I talked to my dad about what it was the technique that, that we were, that he was following, um, there were just some general rules of acting, which was to be very specific in their choices and to know what your objective was in the scene and know what was at stake if you didn't achieve your objective. These are all just basic kind of um, acting 101 techniques that Jeff taught. And there was a lot of different technique, but I think the, the general uh, philosophy was, and I think Dad lived by this as well, whatever works. There's so much out there. There's so much great uh, uh, different uh, technique and different uh, systems of acting out there to choose from. I mean, you've worked with a lot of actors and I've, you know, I, I don't really know that much about acting myself, but I've always kind of felt that in the end, most of those techniques that people are learning are just kind of reiterating to them a lot of what their, what their natural instincts are with it. You know, that you, you well, find yeah. what works for you and you find what speaks to you. Well, I, I think that's true. I mean, there's a wide range uh, of, uh, you know, we, we, you have David Mamet on one end who, who basically says, Hey, find your mark. Uh, find the light, look in the eyes of the other actor and tell the truth. And uh, it's a very simplistic view, but there's a lot of truth to that. And I think dad would, would agree with that. On the other hand, there's a whole plethora of, of stuff that's written from a number of different uh, perspectives on the technique and craft of acting, beginning with uh, Konstantin Stanislavski, the Stanislavski method uh, uh, from, uh, from Russia. And, uh, and, I, and I've read through a lot of it and a lot of it is very helpful, but, but yeah, you want it, particularly as a director, Tim, this is so, it's so interesting. And what I really try to instill with the, my students, you, if you want to help an actor and collaborate with them and are worried about performance issues, it's really important to keep things simple. It's just very important to be very specific about what it is that you want and what you're looking for, to try to collaborate with an actor, to try to help them achieve the performance you're looking for. And it really just has to be very simple and direct about what it is that they want uh, from the other character in the scene. Uh, th- that Sometimes it's just that simple. And sometimes I work with actors who have never been to class, never had any uh, formal training, and are just instinctual, and they're phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll never forget the story. Uh, we've had James Marshall on the program, who was uh, in, in Twin Peaks, and he was relating to us a story, and I won't try to tell it you know, verbatim because I'll just butcher it. But he was just telling this, us the story about he was trying to shoot a particularly complex scene and uh, he wasn't doing a great job of it. And, and David Lynch stopped everything and kind of stood over him and, you know, just looked at him and ran his fingers through his hair kind of thing and just looked at him and said, you know, can just do it better. And, you know, and that's all that it took yeah. for him to be able to do <laughs> it. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes just breathe. I mean, I, I we've had, uh, I was on a number of shows where we had actors who auditioned and they were terrific. And once they got on the set, they were a mess uh, because there was so much pressure and they were dealing with uh, uh, people who had reached a level of stardom in TV and they were intimidated. And, and sometimes just to relax and breathe is, is the note I would, I would give to an actor. So, you know, it's a real joy to be able to work with, with people uh, of, of a certain caliber and craft and, you know, directing is, you know, filmmaking in general is a collaborative art form. I mean, uh, you really want to go in there with a kind of a collegial spirit and try to get the best out of people and uh, your excitement and being, um, you know, enthusiastic about the material, being well prepared with the material, understanding what the scenes are about. I think the acting class was really where I started and was one of the, the best educations I had. I was with Jeff Corey on and off for almost two years, following in my father's footsteps, just learning about the craft. Of what, of what an actor goes to. And, and sometimes I'd watch a rehearsal and you have to really know when to say nothing because it's there. It's as good as it's going to get. 
Uh, well, and, and speaking of, of working as a director with actors, uh, a question comes in via email from Susan. She wants to know of the work that you did on The Next Generation, do you have a favorite episode? Well, I only did two, and they're both my favorite episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Rascals and Timescape, uh, both very challenging. Uh, Rascals, because it was my first episode, and I was dealing with kids. You know, they, they, they say, beware of kids and animals when you're directing. Uh, it it's, makes things significantly more challenging, uh, which it, it was. Uh, so that was my first episode, and I was very nervous. And then my second episode was Timescape, which came near the end of the season. And at the end of the season, people are tired. And it's really challenging to get get people the, get their excitement level up and their energy up. Uh, much more difficult, but they were both very well written. I mean, you know, Next Generation was a great show, and uh, I was really privileged to have been able to work on that show, even just having directed two episodes. It was a really good first start for me. Uh, terrific writers and um, an incredible cast, a great crew. Uh, the production personnel were were excellent. Um, they had very strong leadership uh, under Rick Berman. Um, it was a it was a real well oiled machine, and and it, and they were very tolerant of a very of a very new and green director. You know, and, and just as a side note, I don't think people understand just how um, how important some of those just that that whole first run syndication era of the eighties, especially the mid to late eighties. I mean, they were putting out some great. I mean, not every show. Not every series, you know, was memorable television, but that was a great vehicle to be able to get programs like The Next Generation out there. If that had been a network show, you know, there would have been probably a lot of the same issues that they had with the original series. But because it was first-run syndication and Paramount was the ones running the show, they could really kind of do the vision that they had for it without worrying about all of these other, you know, network notes coming in all the time. Yeah, I think that's true. I think they had a unique position being in the in the uh, the first run syndication market, which was a whole new, you know, a kind of uh, frontier, if you will. Um, uh, you know, it's very, and it took a while for them to find their voice too. I mean, there was a lot of struggle. We there, in in Rod's movie, uh, Trick Nation. It's very interesting that you know Gene didn't want any conflict in in the the in in the future in the twenty third century. I think it is. And, uh, and when you don't have conflict, you don't have drama. So it's very <laughs> difficult for a writer. Um, but I think, and after a while, I think they really began to find their voice. Uh, they told some incredible stories. There were a number of episodes. My favorites were like, uh, you know, besides my own were, uh, inner light and conundrum. I mean, there were just some fabulous episodes, uh, excellent directors. And, uh, uh, many of them, my mentors, uh, including, uh, David Carson, who shot the pilot for deep space nine. And, and Generations, the first movie with the uh, Next Generation cast. So um, it was, uh, and I think they, they had more breathing room. Yeah, and they, I think they, they may not met, have maybe survived if they were a network TV show. So uh, there were a lot of factors that kind of fell into place that really helped uh, propel that show, and not the least of which was a phenomenal cast. Yeah, and, and by the way, I love Generations. Uh, I, I I remember seeing that in the movie theater like four or five times with all m- different groups of my friends to go out and see it because I had some friends that were fans of the original series, and I had some fans that were uh, some friends that were only fans of the Next Generation. So I kind of had to I couldn't go with both of them at the same time. So we had to kind of pick and choose who went where. So it was it was kind of funny that you know you get there in the movie theater, you know, the the teenage kid taking the tickets is like you're here again. Yep. Yep. I'm here again. Uh-huh, yeah. Right. Couldn't get enough of that movie though. It's just yeah. so well done. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, as you were putting together, uh, for the love of Spock and, and, and really looking into the character of Spock. How was it that you were able to kind of take the forest for the trees approach to something that has become so iconic? Because sometimes when you have an iconic character like that, it's, it's, it's gotta be kind of hard to separate the legend from the actual performance of the character well uh, we you know yeah we um that's a good question it was it was very difficult to pick and choose what exactly we were going to show of the character uh what was important within the time you know the the space that we had to tell that particular story and i think you know and we looked at a lot of film we looked we considered a lot of episodes I mean, it's just a huge amount of material which coincidentally was an interesting experience for me in a way to mourn my father because I'm we're looking at all this stuff and all the stuff that he had done and all the family photos and people were sending in stuff and we had researchers looking up stuff and 
photos were coming in of, of my family that I'd never seen before. I would never didn't remember the photo shoot that we had. And it was a real interesting way of processing my relationship with my dad. But one of the keys were we had, we had an excellent production team in place who knew the series. And then we brought in uh, an editor from the outside, Janice Hampton, um, and we hired her because we wanted a, a woman's sensibility. And we also, and because she had a lot of experience in film, but the, the, the clincher for me when I first met with her was what she told me. And interestingly enough, that she knew absolutely nothing about Star Trek. And that was it on the spot. I just said, okay, you're in, you're hired. Boom. You're in. Uh, because we wanted somebody who had an outside perspective and wasn't so immersed in, in the lore and in the history of Star Trek. Uh, and, and she was very helpful uh, in helping us stay on track, on point, on theme about what is it that we're trying to say about Spock or about Leonard and his life or about Adam and Leonard and their life together. It was critical to have an outsider who could help us keep perspective and an eye on the, on the forest the whole time while we were looking at, you know, tree after tree after tree. Um, it, it takes, it's a delicate balance. Uh, the editorial itself is an art form unto itself. And we were very lucky. I had Dave Zapone, my co-producing partner who knew everything you needed to know about Star Trek, the original series and the spin-off series and plenty that you simply do not need to know about Star Trek, <laughs> the original series and all the spin-off series. So I, I was very fortunate that we had a, a tremendously great production team with me. And you, you really had some, some heavy hitters in that for interviews. I mean, you talked to, uh, some very key people that could talk about not only Star Trek, the original series, but also the lasting legacy of the character. I mean, uh, just, it's a, it's a who's who of people that you would want to have talking about, about Mr. Spock. Uh, yeah, we were very lucky. Uh, we, we flew to, uh, Vancouver, in fact, uh, to film everybody in the, in the JJ. Trek, the new Star Trek crew. Uh, I'm very lucky to have access to them. Um, and then we, we, we were able to interview uh, people like uh, JJ and uh, Nick Meyer, who directed some of the movies. And uh, we were just, uh, and, and uh, DC Fontana, uh, who uh, just passed away last year, one of the original writers from the original series. So we, we had, we were able to get a really good cross section of people who were somehow connected uh, to Star Trek to give their perspectives on on the show, on the character, uh, and on Leonard Nimoy, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the original crew, uh, we had, we were able to interview many people, uh, who gave their perspectives. So, um, we, we covered a lot of territory in a very short period of time. Um, we, we raised money through Kickstarter campaign independently and, uh, and we, we were able to put the film together very quickly. I mean, this is the difference between, uh, the love of Spock and Trek nation. Trek nation is a great film, but Rod himself will admit it took him 10 years to put the film together. Mm -hmm. uh, for the love of Spock, we raised the money really in June of 2015 with the Kickstarter program. And in April of 2016, we had a, uh, a film festival cut of the film to show at Tribeca, New York, to premiere the film originally. The commercial release, we, we saved until September of, of 2016, which was the 50th anniversary. So uh, we traveled far in a short period of time, but we, a lot, there were a lot of things that were, we had a lot of support from a lot of people to help us put that film together. That, that is a very quick turnaround, though. You must have been, you know, handling all the edits and everything as you were going along. Well, we were. We were cutting while we were, we were filming interviews, absolutely. Um, but uh, we, we, and we had a tremendous editorial staff, beginning with uh, Janice and, uh, and, and Joe and Luke. I mean, we had three people in there cutting that film. Uh, so, and they knew what they were doing. So, um, yeah, we were, we, we had to move quickly because we simply didn't have the time or, or the finances to keep, uh, to keep going. Uh, and it was better that it just came out that way because it, it kept us focused on, um, you know, what it is that we wanted to produce. Um, it, it just, it just forces you. It's like making an eight day TV show. Uh, when you're directing, you, you're just forced to, to really focus on, what it is that the episode's about, uh, what is important to get on film, uh, what is secondary that can maybe be left behind, and, uh, and how to best use the time allotted uh, uh, that you've been given. I remember when, when there was announced that J.J. Abrams was going to be, you know, putting out this new version of Star Trek. The first question that popped into my head, well, if that's the case, who's going to play Spock? And 
and I was a little bit surprised with the the fact that they cast Zachary Quinto at first, but then it, you know, I I was a big fan of Heroes, and I I knew that show very well, and I said, you know what? Actually, I don't know if I could think of anybody else that could step into that role. How how was what was Leonard's uh, opinion of the way that Zachary had taken on that role? Well, they had a very close close relationship. I think I think Dad was very pleased with with what Zach did with that role because. You know, Zach brought his own sensibility. That's the whole key. Zach is a is a a crass person. I mean, you know, he he really he he knew what he was doing. Uh, he is of such a caliber that he could not only and it was a careful balancing act, which I think he does wonderfully, and I think Dad felt the same way, where he can pay tribute and uh, and honor uh, the tradition of who of who we knew Spock was, and at the same time bring something of his own to the party, his own personality, his own technique, his own uh, sensibility, his own history. Um, you know, I mean, he's a very thoughtful uh, uh, a guy, you know, guy with a deep inner voice of his own. And I think it was based on that, that the two, you know, like recognizes like, you know, I mean, people, you know, birds of a feather, and they were birds of a feather, Dad and, and Zach, and they, they really, they, they, you know, they melded, they mind melded, <laughs> I think. They, I think they, they became very good personal friends. Um, I, I, I got to admit, uh, uh, Tim, there was one time when I was in New York, uh, and I, I, I was going to meet them. We were all meeting together for lunch, and, and Dad and Zach were there early, and they were really connecting and talking about stuff. And I had a, there was a little twinge of jealousy, you know, <laughs> that, uh, that Zach was sort of like the second son to Leonard, and, uh, which went away quickly because Zach was so welcoming and uh, such a part of the family and, and really enjoyed being integrated with the entire, you know, Nimoy clan, uh, that it, he was so disarming to me, but, um, it was really endearing the fact that the two of them could connect over this role. And, and, uh, and it was a real, it was a real sense that, that dad was passing the torch to Zach. And I, you know, I was also impressed too, that he, he followed in his footsteps in taking over the hosting duties for in search of, and, and listen, in search of is one of my favorite shows of all time. The original theme song is the ringtone on my cell phone. It's kind of the guiding principle of, of this series, of this, of this radio show, you know, the idea of talking about all these different things and taking it all seriously. Uh, so that's, you know, to me, it's a, it's a big deal. So to, to have him also be able to step into that role as well and follow in those footsteps, I thought that was very well handled too. Tim, you, you're surprising me. The depth of your knowledge of, that, of your fandom is actually <laughs> shocking. Uh, and uh, you, you're you're very well versed in all of the tradition of Leonard and Star Trek. How it's 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 fascinating to me. When when Michelle said that you were she was working on booking you for the show, I you know the, I couldn't respond at first. Uh, I was so excited. So that's it's. It, <laughs> well, it, thank it, you for having me. I, it's been great. It's, it's it's great. It's a great experience for me to be talking about this stuff, reliving this stuff. I mean. Uh, we're all blessed by the experience. I, I, I'm sitting in my office at home. I've got this great, <clears throat> excuse me, overhead shot of, of uh, Kirk and Spock from the cover of Entertainment Weekly. It's just one of my favorites. And, uh, you know, I, I myself just really love uh, Star Trek lore and, and, uh, and all things Star Trek. So I'm, I'm so happy to be here with you. You know, and you know, you mentioned uh, Kirk, and and I know that there's been when I brought up William Shatner to Walter Koenig, it was uh, a little bit of a sore spot. And I have I've been there at a convention when uh, both William Shatner and George Takei were there together, and it did not go well. Uh, I was kind of caught in the middle of some glares at each other, kind of thing. Um, so, like, I know that not everybody has had a great relationship with William Shatner, but what was, what was your father's relationship with him? Like, do we have dead air now? <laughs> Is there dead air here? Yeah. Uh, anyway, Tim, yes. Uh, their relationship. Uh, how's the weather out there where you are? Hey, it's, anyway, it's yes. hot and humid here. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Leonard and Bill, uh, very complicated, very complicated relationship. A lot of ups and downs. Uh, I mean, there was a time when uh, just a lot of us, <laughs> just crazy. I, I couldn't even keep track, frankly. Uh, look, we talk a little bit about that in the, in the Spock documentary as well. Um, they, they were very competitive. Uh, they were very, they're very close in age. They're just four days apart. Um, you know, a, um, they, uh, they were very strong willed. 
Uh, so was Gene. There was a lot of head knocking between Gene and, and Bill and Leonard uh, when they were making the show. They were under a lot of pressure. They're, they're perfectionists. Um, and there were times when they were very close and when they were, uh, were very uh, reliant on each other as brothers. They love each other like brothers. And it just, it just ebbed and flowed throughout their entire lives together. And, um, I, you know, I can say that uh, there were times when uh, Dad was very close with Bill. And it's interesting because I did, I asked Dad, I, because I knew a lot of the stories, because I was there for some of it, actually. Uh, and, and, uh, and Dad has talked about this, too, of some of the difficulties they had uh, on set. And I said to Dad one day, I, you know, I had really a lot of trouble understanding that there was conflict on the set when you were making the original series, because the chemistry is amazing. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely phenomenal the way you guys play off of each other. How do you pull that off? How did you pull it off? Because sometimes you can't help but see it when, they're, when there's stuff going on behind the camera. And my dad said to me, you know, he said, we were professionals. It was that simple. We were professionals. And we knew to put all of that aside as soon as the camera started rolling. And, and they were. They, they were really uh, at, at, they were at such a level in their craft and their art. And it's also very interesting, Tim, that my dad told me once, and Bill does not remember this, but my dad told me that they were in the commissary at Desilu Studios one day having lunch in makeup and wardrobe, Bill and Leonard sitting there, when they were approached by Lucille Ball, who went up to them and said, thank you for being such professionals. Because those guys showed up on time, they did the work, they went home. You know, and they cranked out a lot of material, they did the shows. There was no problems in the production because of those guys. Oh. Rarely. There was a couple of times where things well, got held up because there were some issues, no doubt. But uh, over the course of three seasons of that show, um, they really did, you know, they stepped up to the plate and they did their job. I so, uh, well, you well, know, I was and, say, and Bill was very generous to us when we made the when we made the documentary. Well, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back on the other side, I'll ask you about that. We'll also get into how the documentary became a reflection and a, and a, and a narration of your relationship with Leonard Nimoy, your father as well. We'll be back with more Midnight Society in just a moment on Midnight.fm. Call into the show. Dial 508 522-1985. That's 508-322-1985. Or Skype, midnight.fm. And welcome back into Midnight Society here on midnight.fm. We are talking with our guest, Adam Nimoy, about his father, Leonard Nimoy, about the documentary For the Love of Spock. And a little bit later on, we'll be joined in the final hour by Rod Roddenberry, the son of Gene Roddenberry, creator of Star Trek, as we will take your phone calls and your questions, and questions keep coming in. I'll keep working them into the discussion. Again, you can call in 508-322-1985. You can Skype us directly at midnight.fm. You can email me, tim at midnight.fm. You can post the questions in the Midnight Society Facebook group, or you can tweet me on Twitter at Tim Weisberg. And we will keep bringing those questions into the discussion. But before the break, Adam, you were you were telling us about Bill Shatner. I don't know if you want to go back to that or if you want to just move on. I will leave it up to you. Oh, we can move on. That would be great. Okay. Uh, well, this question comes from Amy, and and I have to I have to ask this question, or at least just bring this up because uh, I would be remiss because Amy is the Scotty of this program and of this network that whenever there's anything going wrong, you know, she's the one that gets us out of every dangerous situation. Uh, she's the one that keeps this ship running smoothly when it comes to all the technical side of things. And, you know, as much as she loves Star Trek, she says her second favorite show is Columbo. And she just wanted me to mention that Leonard Nimoy was one of the greatest on Columbo uh, one of the greatest Columbo villains, and 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 actually, all I think there's a, quite a few Star Trek cast members that have been Columbo villains, right? Uh, that I don't know, but I would believe you if that were true. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. Yes, uh, Dad was on Columbo. He played a surgeon. I think it was the uh, the disappearing sutures or something. Uh, it's interesting to note that Peter Falk, who was the star of that show, was with Dad and Jeff Corey and Lee Grant. 
uh, in a movie uh, from uh, called The Balcony, Jean Genet, uh, in the early 60s, but well before Star Trek. Uh, so their paths had crossed earlier on. But um, yeah, that was one of the many shows that Dad was doing in, in the late 70s and uh, uh, to, to keep his career going and to keep his hand in TV. And uh, it was a terrific episode. It's so funny that, you, that she's a, a, a Colombo fanatic. Uh, it was a terrific show. Oh, I, I actually have a friend named Ed who may be listening to the show now, but Ed is, uh, somebody who goes to the, the, the conventions and he doesn't go to meet, you know, the Star Trek cast. He doesn't go to meet Star Wars people. You know, when he goes, he just wants to meet people that played villains on Columbo and get their autographs. And he has a collection <laughs> of Columbo villains. It's amazing, but it's, uh, it's one of those things where there is, there is a great fandom for that show just as much as there is for, for Star Trek. Yeah. So yeah, terrific show. Falk was amazing. And 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 also long lasting. I I had never really watched it before. Uh, you know, I'd seen it in bits and pieces. My grandfather would watch it, so I'd see it at his house. But I saw it on the Peacock app, and I re- didn't realize. Oh, this is a character that went on for you know twenty plus years. So another. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Another yeah. institution. Um, but another question came in from Tracy during the break. She asked if you had the chance to work with DC Fontana yourself at all. Uh, not really. No. Um, just had the opportunity to, to interview her. Uh, you know, she, DC Fontana was pretty, uh, pivotal, uh, in the development of the Spock character because she wrote, uh, the side of paradise, which we talk about in the, in the documentary, uh, in which Spock falls in love. So, uh, and, and it, it's just, uh, she did a terrific job. She did a rewrite of the original story idea. Um, it's a fabulous script and, uh, and, and dad talked to her about, was worried about doing that episode, uh, because he, he felt that he had just had a handle on what the Spock character was all about, this internal struggle, these emotions going on inside, but struggling to maintain, uh, this kind of cool, uh, calm demeanor. Uh, and he was worried about letting all that go with this episode, but she did such a great job, such a sensitive job. Uh, uh, writing for that character, um, that I, I think it's one of my favorite episodes, which is why we feature so much, much of it in our, in our documentary. But no, I never got to work with her directly other than that. But you, you were talking earlier about how, you know, growing up at home while, while your father was on Star Trek, that you, it was hard sometimes to, to have him connect on that emotional level because he was playing that character so much. But the Spock character did become more in touch with the human side of himself as time went on. Yeah, I think dad, I think dad got more in touch with the human side of himself (laughs) as time went on. I mean, uh, yeah, look, Tim, it was very complicated. I had a very complicated relationship with him. I mean, uh, I was, you know, it was very difficult. I mean, I'm writing about it now. I wrote about it in my memoir. I I talk about it in, in the, uh, for love of Spock. Um, you know, we had a lot of ups and downs. I had, I had a lot of trouble relating to my dad early on because we were generations apart. Um, you know, when he was 10 years old, he was selling newspapers in the Boston Common during World War II. When I was 10 years old, I was watching TV and, and reading comic books and listening to the Beatles. I mean, it was a very different uh, lifestyle. And, and uh, you know, we didn't have the struggles that he had to go through. And uh, he wasn't around during these formative years. And then when he was around in the seventies, I was a teenager and rebelling and, you know, grateful dead this and, you know, and experimenting with substances that, and it, it, it was a lot of head knocking and, and this went on for a while. I mean, we, we just had a lot of trouble relating to each other. Um, and, and even he, he himself had said, uh, in, in some of the, uh, uh, documentaries and interviews that I've, I've heard from him was that, he uh, and, and in our documentary, he talks about the fact that in the in the third act of his life, he really was playing the role of of family man and being interested and supportive of uh, particularly the grandchildren, my children, my sister's children um, and uh, of Aaron, his stepson. I mean, he changed a lot. He mellowed quite a bit. I mean, he went through a, a real metamorphosis. He was a much different personality to deal with, uh, much more patient and loving and able to express himself, very appreciative of family get-togethers. I mean, he really was like the godfather of the family. Uh, he sat at the head of the table, and, and it would always, before we had a meal, talk about uh, 
the gratitude he had that we were together as a family and there was a lot of love and a lot of a tolerance for one another and, and patience. And, and uh, uh, we were so lucky to have him that long in his life where he, he could really, you know, turn around and, and uh, re- rearrange his priorities, quite frankly. Yeah. And, and I think in anything that he was in as an actor or as a host, you know, he always had the gravitas when he was speaking. He, you know, when when he said something, people paid attention and they listened. And it sounds like it was kind of the same way with the family as well. Yeah, because he, you know, uh, a lot of us were in the industry, and uh, you know, in one form or another, uh, music industry or or TV and film. And and uh, he, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he, you know, my son is an artist, uh, just like dad. Uh, struggled in academia, but uh, was always drawing and uh, and rehearsing and recording and playing and, and performing. And, uh, you know, there was just a lot of dad really was paying attention. He really saw this is kind of the theme of this new memoir I'm writing is about being seen. And uh, he was really looking at the, the family members. And, and he did. He had the gravitas. Uh, and was very wise, and uh, everybody would go to him. It's funny, we would take turns sitting in the seat next to him to whisper to him about stuff that was going on, and he would render, you know, his thoughts and feelings. Um, very supportive, uh, very helpful, uh, you know, very happy to be uh, to be integrated and asked, you know, really to play that role. Every family function that we had, whether it was Shabbat dinner on a Friday night or Thanksgiving dinner, or whatever holiday we were celebrating, um, very always expressed his gratitude that we were together. And and what about with the fandom? I mean, we we hear about different, you know, uh, you know, at different times, different actors involved with Star Trek had love hate relationships with some of the fandom. Of course, you know, we don't need to dive down the Shatner role, but it it does take you know a lot out of people, uh, a lot out of these these actors to be associated with some of these big time events that are, you know, you've got these, these hundreds of thousands of fans coming through over the course of a weekend and everybody wants a piece of you. How did he kind of relate to, to the Star Trek fans, especially in his later years? Yeah. Another good question. Boy, Tim, you, I'm just, I, I applaud you. You're really you're covering the whole gamut here because that was a big part of the experience. Uh, you know, it's look, it's, it's fan based and uh, dad knew that and recognized that right away. Um, the response to Spock was uh, astronomical from the beginning. Uh, you know, just after a few episodes, we were seeing the fan mail, unfortunately showed up at our house accidentally. Um, you know, he really understood that, that he really had a relationship with them. He was being seen by them. He was being recognized by them. I think this, this was really important to him. Uh, I think it had a lot to do with the fact that his parents did not recognize him for what he was doing. They did not want him to go to Hollywood. Uh, and even when he was famous, they had trouble uh, relating to, to expressing their pride and love for him. Although the fans were showering my grandparents with, with, you know, love and affection. Um, you know, he really understood this and really, and, and you can really see that in the early uh, home movies that we have of him at those early conventions where people were just going crazy. Uh, all of them, I think really welcomed that and really felt like their work was being recognized because of the syndication market that was playing Star Trek five days a week. I mean, I was in college at Berkeley, and at 5 o'clock every weekday, everybody stopped studying, and they were in the TV room at the dorm. You know, I mean, it was such a, a response from the fans. And Dad loved the convention circuit. He loved speaking at colleges. He loved interacting with the fans. He really, he really felt, you know, vindicated by the work he had done, and he deserved it, frankly. And, and you know, it was a struggle for me because I had to share him with the fans, and some of it was exciting because I could watch from the shadows and, and not have to deal with it. But on the other hand, it was tough because we had to constantly share him with the fans and it took away from family private time. Yeah. And also I would imagine too that it, it's something where you're constantly worried about making sure that the version of yourself that you present to these fans is, is who they think that you are. You know, you don't, you don't get the chance to just go somewhere and be Leonard Nimoy necessarily. You have to go there and be the Leonard Nimoy that the fans are expecting. And, and that probably involves incorporating some Spock into yourself as well. Well, the fact is, Tim, I mean, Leonard is just a very interesting person to be around, period. Uh, uh you know, I, I, he has so much going on when he would, uh, 
would be at the convention or be at these student lectures. I mean, I saw a number of them. Um, this is a man with, uh, he could be very uh, charismatic, uh, very compelling, very entertaining, uh, very interactive, uh, very responsive, uh, loved to take questions. Uh, I heard him speak. In fact, at, at Boston University, he was, uh, gave a keynote address to the School of Communications, and he was just fabulous. I mean, he was so compelling and so what he had to say resonated so much. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I love to hear, just sit and hear him speak. I, you know, he, he's just, uh, he had so much knowledge. He is a, a good friend of the family who was a novelist said he was an incredibly intelligent man considering how undereducated he was because he had a, a, a very vast curiosity about the way the world works and, and, uh, um, issues facing us in the world and what the art form was about and uh, a real sense of where he came from, who he is. Uh, you know, he was able to share that and convey that on stage. And I think it just, I, I think the fans just adored him. And, and frankly, when I was going to conventions after he passed away, meeting these fans who were just overjoyed to just shake my hand and, and have this DNA connection to Leonard Nimoy, you know, it, in a way it was very, satisfying for me, frankly, because uh, I then could feel the love and the passion that they had for him, uh, which I shared with them in the later years of his life because I was so close to him. I mean, and it seemed like he always understood the the legacy of Star Trek. I was reading a story uh, online about with the animated series uh, that, you know, he fought to make sure that uh that that George and Michelle were included in that series that um even though they cut Walter Koenig's character from the series you know that it was it was Leonard Nimoy's championing that got them to buy a, you know one of the scripts from him so he was very much somebody who understood that Star Trek from the beginning stood for kind of something more than just being a, a great TV series well, yeah, I mean, it was important to him. I mean, I mean, the bottom line is, again, this is the early 70s and people are looking for work. And uh, I, I think Dad had a real sense of, um, of trying to help people, <laughs> you know, find work. And I, I think it, it really shocked him that they were being cut out and not going to be included uh, in this animated series. Everybody should participate uh, in, in what they had created together. Um, so, in fact, Dad once told me that Gene Roddenberry said to Dad that he felt that, that Dad was, in, in large part, the social conscience of Star Trek because of, of, of that incident uh, with, with that particular, with the animated series, and also uh, that Star Trek IV involved uh, the whales, you know, this whole idea of, of saving the planet, uh, being eco-friendly, um, you know, that, there, that, that Dad had that sensibility. So... That was the kind of guy Dad was, and, and you know, and it's interesting when you see those that that film that we have of him at the conventions. I mean, uh, and everybody's applauding them. He's got his arms around like Nichelle and and and, uh, and George, you know, because there he understood its ensemble that there is no single individual responsible for what they had created. It was everybody in it together. Um, you know, it was the uniqueness of this of this kind of cosmopolitan cast. Uh, of characters and everything that they contributed to this project together that was important and everybody should be recognized. And, and in that respect, he was an incredibly generous person. And I would think that that mindset, especially, you know, during when the season, uh, the series was in production, the original series was in production and you're seeing all of this going on, getting the chance to go there and, and visit the set and seeing all of this camaraderie amongst people who were very different, that probably kind of ingrained in, in you that, that that's kind of the way that the world works, that everybody has to kind of get along to work as one team for the common good. Well, I, I mean, I, again, I was, I was nine when they started shooting and I must say, I mean, I, it, it wasn't the social conscience that, that Gene Roddenberry was configuring that, that I was thinking about when I was there. It was so overwhelmingly awesome to be <laughs> on the set, just the, just the sense experience of uh, being on the the various uh, set pieces that were there, being on the Planet from Hell stage, uh, seeing the uh, the uh, being in wardrobe and seeing the uh, the aliens that they were making up in uh, in makeup, uh, uh, you know, uh, when you walked on the set, you're just immediately overwhelmed by by this uh, by the set effects guy Jim Rugg. They were constantly making these resin molds for the buttons and stuff on 
on on the Enterprise and on the space shuttles that they had the uh, the Galileo. Uh, you know, it was just like it was like glue sniffers paradise. I mean, it was just you're overwhelmed by all these these sensory things that are going on, and then seeing Dad walking around with such stature in makeup and 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 in in character, you know. Uh, that dad was, you know, really focused on the work he was doing. I mean, those are the things that a, a nine and 10 year old boy was thinking about and, and experiencing uh, when I was there. Did you ever get in trouble for anything that you might have done or touched? Did you ever break a prop or anything like that? I didn't. But the, what I what the one moment uh, that I had was I was always trying to get like I had dad and Bill Shatner signing pictures for me. And uh, I had him sign uh, uh, two or three of them. And, and after the third one, dad said to me, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is the biggest trouble I got into. And of course, we pulled this prank, you know, on the blooper reel where where uh, in one of the episodes uh, they were shooting. And this is July of 66 before the show even aired, where they, they opened up the turbo lift and I come walking out and I give my dad a kiss. Uh, that was, you know, a great joy to to have that experience to to, they pulled me aside and said, we're going to pull a little, you know, we're going to pull a joke on your dad. And the tape put me into Fred Phillips makeup chair where he cut my hair and put on a pair of dad's ears. You know, all the, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's been an incredible ride. Incredible. I mean, I, I, I'm just so lucky, I think, to have been a part of it and, and to be, you know, a Trekkie before, uh, before the fandom really kicked in. Um, I feel so privileged, frankly. Now, growing up, did you ever get the eyebrow? If anything went no, wrong, never, or did he ever raise I that eyebrow? Do, I could not do the eyebrow, and I can only do the Spock salute with my left hand. I don't know why that that all is. But but did he uh, did he uh, ever give you the eyebrow for anything you might have done? Oh, well, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yes, he did, he would do that. He would be Spock like, and. Uh, uh, it's funny because we there's this episode in, in a book I'm writing now where uh, we had to have a sit down with my son, Jonah, and uh, and and uh, it was kind of an intervention. And dad said, what do you want me to do? I said, don't do anything. Just be Spock like, like, just just say, mm -hmm, nod your head, be expressionless. And once in a while, you know, throw in an eyebrow. That's all you got to do. And he was perfect. He was he, he could play it. He could do it. He. He was perfect. He was intimidating. He was perfect. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it happened to me a couple of times. I mean, uh, it's it just, I tell you, Tim, it was just phenomenal. One time we went over there for dinner to his house, and I had just seen the, uh, the, um, the uh, menagerie where they incorporated the pilot into the first season of Star Trek, and Dad was so good. And I went to the house, and I said, Dad, I just, I just looked at the menagerie again, the two-parter, and you were just phenomenal. And he said to me, you know what, I was at that point, I was really on my game. I knew what I was doing. I had a I had a grip on what the character was all about. And, um, he, he, you know, it was really a part of me. I, I just felt so secure. And um, it was it's just a great to be able to share those kind of moments with him, uh, you know, about his experience. So then it, it sounds like you weren't too much of a troublemaker. So you probably never got the nerve pinch. Uh, I never got the nerve pain. I was a, I was in trouble. I mean, I had a lot of trouble with that. I'm telling you, we had a lot of crazy conflict. And uh, but uh, no, I never got the nerve pinch. I do have some family photos of him giving it to Jonah, my son. Um, you know, uh, no, I, it's it's just so interesting the stories and and the fact that that Spock was with him his whole life. He was proud to be a part of that tradition. He was so proud when. J.J. Abrams called him to do, you know, Trek 09, the, the, the whole reiteration of Star Trek, because uh, dad was in the original pilot, along with Major Barrett, uh, Rod Roddenberry's mother, um, who came in as Nurse Chapel under the regular season of the original series. But dad was in that very first pilot. And then dad was in this, the last beginning of the iteration with J.J. Abrams and felt a tremendous sense of pride that he had been in, in all aspects of Star Trek. He he had participated. So um, he, uh, you know, it, it, Spock character was always present uh, with him. Sometimes he, he would slip into Spock and, uh, and we were, we all enjoyed it and were amused by it when he did. And, and, and it's funny because, you know, you mentioned how, how Gene Roddenberry called him kind of the social conscience of Star Trek, but he was that connecting thread because in the end, he's the living embodiment Spock is of, of everything that Star Trek is about, about this, 
this balance, uh, finding this balance between who we are as, as earth people, as human beings and living amongst those who are alien to us and, and finding a way to peacefully coexist. And, and he had to find Spock had to find a way to have that coexisting coexistence within himself. Correct. I mean, it's, it's, it's whole, Roddenberry's whole idea of infinite diversity and infinite combinations, IDIC. And, uh, uh, yeah, and that was what the Spock tradition was all about. And that was, I think, really important for my dad when he really kind of understood that that was the overall objective of the character is to, again, how to assimilate and give the best that you have to offer for the benefit of the many, of the crew. Uh, and, I, and that was kind of his overarching philosophy, which really kept him very specific about what it is, what is important about the Spock character. And um, and and how how do the patience, the tolerance, living with everybody, uh, accepting people, um, you know, trying to understand foreign cultures, uh, seeing uh, challenges as uh, uh, sci- from a scientific mind as being interesting, and we should get to know these these alien uh, cultures uh, and beings instead of being uh, uh, you know uh, afraid and, and in a combative mood in in addressing them and confronting them. I mean, all these aspects were are so important to uh, the social conscious of what Star Trek was all about. All right, well, we are going to take our next break coming up here in just a moment. When we come back after that break, we will be joined by Rod Roddenberry. And, and Adam, you're going to stick around with us, too? I will. All right, and we'll have the phone lines open for everybody out there. 508-322-1985. I just got to warn everybody that when I when I try to call Rod on the phone, it might go out over the uh, commercials. If that happens, just pretend like it didn't. Because uh, the system did that the last time I tried to bring a guest on mid-show, and I thought I had everything fixed, but uh, in case it does, you know, it's Mercury Retrograde, as everybody likes to keep reminding me. So that's why we keep having technical issues. So I wouldn't be surprised if that happens again. But uh, also, if you have any questions that you want to call in with, again, 508-322-1985 is the number. Email me, Tim, at midnight.fm, if you would like to send questions in in written form. Also, the conversation is rolling in the Midnight Society Facebook group, and I think that uh, we have lots of people in there that I would love to hear the sound of their voice with some of the questions that they have, as we're going to be continuing on talking about the legacy of Star Trek. We'll talk with Rod about his work in keeping the legacy alive, and believe me, he is also directly connected to things that are going on with Star Trek right now, so we'll get into all of that as well. Really quick reminder for everybody out there, we will have the giveaway for the Voice Duo AI Radio, and I know that I've been talking about this for the last month, but we will be giving that away, and uh, we will have the drawing for that, Later on this week, yes, later on this week, we will have you have the opportunity to win the Voice Duo AI Radio. If you want to get one for yourself, though, you don't want to wait around and try to win one from me. All you have to do is go to voice.link, V-O-I-Z dot L-I-N-K, and you'll be able to purchase the best Wi-Fi streaming radio on the market with lossless sound and a beautiful design. Normally $299, you can get it right now. For under $180, just use the promo code MIDNIGHT to check out. All right, we'll be back with more Midnight Society coming your way in just a few moments. Rod Roddenberry joining the discussion. Adam Nimoy sticking with us. More Midnight Society coming your way in a few moments on Midnight.fm. Show style 508 322 1985. That's 508 322 1985 or Skype midnight.fm. Okay, so it took a little bit of uh, phone acrobatics. But I think I now have both of our guests on the line here as we continue on with Midnight Society here on Midnight.fm. And those are the numbers to call in 
If you have any questions here in the final hour of this night dedicated to the legacy of Star Trek, because not only are we talking with Adam Nimoy, the son of Leonard Nimoy and a director in his own right who has the film For the Love of Spock about his father and about the Spock character, we're also going to be joined now by another second-generation Star Trek legend. Rod Roddenberry serves as a television producer for shows such as Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Picard. He's also the current CEO of Roddenberry Entertainment. So, and he is joining us now on the line. I think we have you here, Rod. Are you there? Okay, Adam, you're still here, right? I'm here. Okay, and and, and Rod, do we have you? All right, I will. Uh, I'll have to see if we can add him into the call here. See, things are going so well, Adam, and then this happens. Mm-hmm. This is why you need Scotty. <laughs> I wish, I wish it was that, I wish it was that easy to, uh, to just be able to do that. When you look at Star Trek, Adam, and you look at some of the way that they were able to do, uh, the things they were able to do with that communication, you know, who would have thought that all these years later we'd be doing the exact same thing we saw on the bridge of the Enterprise? Uh, well, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of parts of Star Trek that have shown up in, in, uh, real life, uh, society. Yeah, this, it was so much easier on the bridge of the Enterprise than it is doing it this way. The documentary, Adam, for the love of Spock, that came out in 2016. Correct. And I, yeah, I, I was going to say I would assume that that by now there's probably been you know quite a bit of fan showings of it. Uh, I'm sure that you probably had the opportunity to get out and speak to some of the fans about it. What has been their reaction to it? Well, uh, I think the uh, the fans uh, seem to enjoy it because we uh, we gave them a good dose of Spock. We, you know. Uh, I think the feeling is that we were able to uh, generally the consensus is that we were able to balance the fine line between uh, these three elements, the, the Spock story, the Leonard story and the, and the, the story of, uh, of, of me and dad. So, um, uh, you know, we put, a, there's a lot of, we put a lot of work into it, Tim. I mean, we really worked uh, hard to make it an entertaining film. I think people, I mean, it's, it's done very well. Uh, the reviews came out that were very well, we, we, it's been very well received. We were very, fortunate um because i was worried about a number of elements of the film um uh, rotten tomatoes was very good to us and uh and the fan, res- fan response has been good you know uh, particularly when i go, go to the conventions to talk about it people feel that they, they they got some insight to the character and to dad that they didn't really know before i mean a lot of it is is rehash of the hardcore fans know of so we tried to uh intertwine things that were new and unique particularly my story about my relationship with my dad when you did, you know, hear back from the fan, I'm sure that was very rewarding, not only for you, but for, you know, for the memory of your father to know that the fans care just as much about him as the person and you as his son as they do about the character that they've come to, to know and love. Uh, yeah, that was pretty clear when, when he passed away that, that people were, you know, um, we're, we're very much feeling the loss of Leonard Nimoy, the, the artist, the photographer, the recording artist, the humanitarian, uh, the social activist. I mean, uh, he was a Renaissance man, my dad. He just he appealed to people on a lot of different levels. And, um, it, you know, it was really nice to, to kind of get the sense that it wasn't just uh, – he. his most famous role is obviously Spock, but he was a man who was always trying to explore the boundaries of his artistic integrity and ability. And I think people, a lot of people related to that. He was always trying to recreate himself. All right. And I think that I've now done what I need to do here to try and bring him up. Let's see again. See, it'd be so much easier if I just had Scotty to handle it. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> okay. More power. Now I think now I think we have it working. Yep, there we go. All right. Are you with us now, Hello. Rod? I am here. Hello, sorry about that. I, I apologize. We we were giving her all she got, but it just wasn't enough. No, no, I, I just didn't know if I was doing something wrong or what. So, uh, and, and I don't know if we're on the air right now. I don't know how yep. any of this is working. We are on the air. It is working now. It's Skype and it's Mercury Retrograde. <laughs> so, we, you never know how it's going to how it's going to play out. All right. Well, thank you for Hi, joining Rod. us. Adam here. Hi, Rod. Thanks for coming. Hey, how you doing, Adam? Thank you so much for uh, inviting uh, me to this. Uh, to the both of you, really. But thank you. And, and and really, it's our honor to to be able to have both of you here on the program talking about the legacy of Star Trek. Because you know, Rod, this is something that I'm sure, you know, when when your father Gene Roddenberry created Star Trek, he he wanted to get across 
you know, some of the, 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 the issues of the time, but here we are, you know, all these years later and it's still reflective of who we are as a, as a society and, and where we see ourselves coming hopefully in the future. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the future that, uh, that I, I, I'm most interested in. And after 50 some odd years, I don't want to be pessimistic. I, I hope we would have uh, moved a little further ahead, but in some ways we haven't. We certainly have. There's optimism, but, uh, you know, that, things are still happening and we still need these messages out there in, in Star Trek and everything. So as, as we talked about with Adam a little bit earlier in the program, I'll ask you uh, what it was like, you know, growing up in the shadow of Star Trek. You know, as a young kid, it, it didn't matter to me. Um, I was brought up fairly privileged. Um, believe it or not, I certainly by no means was anyone unable to put food on the table. It wasn't about that. It was, uh, Star Trek didn't really turn a profit until uh, my father got his first check for Star Trek in something like 1982 or a first substantial check in 1982. Wow. Um, and Star Trek came out in 66. And uh, it's because they said, you know, it wasn't making any money. And um, it, it went into syndication in the 70s. And, and even if it wasn't making money, it, it was getting support. And finally, after my family audited the company, I'm going into a complete tangent, of course. Um, there was money there, and, and that's when my family started. Anyhow, I grew up relatively privileged, and it wasn't until I my father passed away that the weight of Star Trek sort of hit me. Um, and it, listen, it, it, it's all self-imposed. Um, the weight of Star Trek hit me because I realized Star Trek was more than just entertainment. You know, at that young age, at the age of 17, I, I was a crazy little teenager. I liked my Starsky and Hutch and Knight Rider and all those shows. I wasn't into Star Trek, but when people started telling me how Star Trek changed their life for the better, you know, it was a, it was a punch to the gut. It was a holy sh- whatever. Yeah. I can't believe this TV show affected people in this way. And that's when I both became very proud of my father and Star Trek and the legacy and very uh, overcome with what it meant for the future and my future and who I was and where I fit into it. Yeah, I, I can imagine, too, that it's something that people, as you said, you know, they look at it and they say, oh, you know, it must have been great to, to be growing up, you know, being the son of the creator of Star Trek and being the son of, you know, one of the one of the actors on Star Trek. And you must have had this fantastic life. But in the end, it's 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 a television show and you're 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 dealing with all the in and out ins and outs of that and all of the different contractual problems of that. And it's not, you know, television isn't as glamorous as, uh, as, as people think that it is. Yeah. I, I, I'm not going to paint a picture that my life was rough by any stretch of the imagination. Sure. It certainly wasn't. Um, but again, as I tell self imposed in terms of, listen, if, if this were star Wars and don't get me wrong, I love star Wars. I grew up with star Wars. I still love star Wars. I'm enough of a fan to have, issues with the way Star Wars is being done right now. Um, but Star Wars is entertainment. And sure, there's the message of good and bad. Star Trek is different. Star Trek has really inspired people to believe themselves, believe in the people around them, to believe in humanity, to want to live in a future like that. So uh, it was self-imposed pressure of, wow, okay, what the hell am I going to do to try to carry this on, to keep trying to inspire people. Um, and I'll tell you the truth. I'm still trying to figure that out. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the other part of it is you now have this legacy that is kind of hanging over you to some degree. Have you ever felt that there's a burden of, of Star Trek in your life? So, uh, I, I did a documentary called Trek Nation, came out in 2011 or 12, I can't remember, and it, and it goes into his son searching to understand his father and sort of the man behind Star Trek. And uh, uh, I, I went into a bit of it there. And yes, I, I felt that for a while, um, but then I, I, it was an amazing process. I mean, the, the film took 10 years to make, not because it was that extensive, it was because I made that many mistakes along the way. Um, but I learned a great deal and was I was able to step out of my father's shadow and just be my own person. I'm I'm not Gene Roddenberry. I'm not going to try to be Gene Roddenberry. I am a Roddenberry and damn proud of it. And whatever it is I do, 
even if I open up a lawnmower repair shop, I'm going to try to do it with the ethics and inspire people around me. That was a terrible example, but you get the idea. Sure. No, absolutely. And and we were we were talking with Adam about for the love of Spock, and so the same thing kind of. I'm sure you went through the same thing with Trek Nation where you set out with the idea of making something that's about this part of your life, and then as you go on with it, you realize just how personal the story really is. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. That's exactly what happened. I, I mean, what was what what was something that you learned from that process that you that you might not have known going into it? Whether it be about your father or about Star Trek, anything along those lines. It, it was important to me to humanize my father. Um, from that up, up until that point, you know, I'd gone to conventions and every fan that I met, you know, revered my father and put him up on a pedestal. And it was the great Gene Roddenberry. And by all means, he is the great Gene Roddenberry, but I would say we're all great people. Anyhow, um, it was important to humanize him for two reasons. Uh, as a son, I, I can't identify with, I can't connect with this Greek God that's on a pedestal. I mean, you can't identify with it. It's, it's beyond my ability. Um, so I, I needed to humanize him. I, so I, I sought out people to interview that didn't like him. Um, Harlan Ellison, who there's a, if you're in the fan community and you know something about the original series, there was a long standing sort of um, feud is not the right thing, but they, they, there was no love lost between them because my father rewrote his episode. And uh, I, I reached out to him because I wanted to hear his side of it. Um, he, he didn't really go into any detail and, and he, he wouldn't go on the documentary, but I, my point is I needed a balance. I needed to find the people who hated him and the people who loved him. And you know what? I found my father right there in the middle. And by humanizing him for me, a son, I was able to connect with him and love him even more than I ever had. And then for the documentary, for those out there who revered him, they could see him and his flaws and see that, it sounds foolish for me to say this out loud, but he was just a normal human being who, who was incredibly flawed and, and made mistakes. And he, yes, he created Star Trek. He didn't make everything about Star Trek. Countless people contributed to make Star Trek what it is. Um, but that doesn't make him any less great of a person. He is still the genius who came up with the idea, the bear, the, the backbone of it. And then, the, the team came together and made Star Trek what it is today. And I'd say the fans have come together and made Star Trek what it is today. And, and, and I know that there's a, there's a bit of an age difference uh, between the two of you. So, you know, uh, Rod, you weren't there when the original series was airing, but Adam, how, how great was it for you to find somebody that you could connect with that kind of understood what it was like for you to be, you know, kind of the son of Star Trek. Uh, you mean with Rod connecting yeah. with Rod? Connecting with Rod. Uh, I think it's it's great. I think it's great uh, because we have such similar experience. I mean, uh, we we <laughs> are walking around in a in a world of Star Trek where our fathers are revered uh, for the creation of this phenomenon uh, and have in, have inspired people and uh, you know and, and Rod likes to emphasize you know really what the message is, which is that 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 you know the future is good, uh, particularly in a time when there was so much turmoil. And, and a time that we are, we're sort of like uh, replicating in some ways now, uh, we still have Star Trek to look at as a positive outlook for the future. And, uh, I, I think it's great. I, you know, I feel a lot of affinity to Rod. I mean, I, I think I'm 18 years older than Rod, but I, we, I, you know, I see myself in Rod. He's had so much similar experience to me. It is so satisfying. And, and when we, you know, we hang out with Chris doing, it's just, it's great to be uh, with that other, the next generation of, of guys who have, you know, have watched this from the wings. And um, there's just an affinity I have. And I, I, I'm, you know, I'm really, I, I'm really thankful that, that I bumped into Rod because I, again, I really feel like we're sharing similar experiences and we've had like the similar load to bear, frankly. And, uh, uh, and that makes us kind of, that, you know, gives me a sense of, of uh, joy to have somebody who can understand my own experience. Now, now, Rod, for yourself, yeah. I mean, we we talked with with Adam about what it was like for uh, him to make for the love of Spock and and kind of learn about his father and and and, and examine their relationship uh, toward the end of, of Leonard Nimoy's life. But for you, you lost your father at a, at a pretty young age. Yeah, uh, yeah, when I was seventeen. So I mean, I, I don't know where that fits in on the, the good or bad of things. 
um, in terms of when it's easier to lose a parent. It's obviously never easy to lose a parent. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I, I definitely wish he had lived longer so I could have matured up and maybe had some more adult conversations about the world. Um, But, but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, mean, I certainly I miss that about him for sure, and, and it and it seems like you know you have to kind of as an adult learn about him through stories from from other people from those who knew him those who who worked for them of course obviously you know your your own family can share stories too but I'm sure for you there was that process of of, of learning about things in terms of secondhand information. Well, let, I, I, I want to say something that uh, <laughs> usually shocks people at first. Um, there is one thing that is truly wonderful personally about my father passing away. <laughs> and that is, I don't know if I would have learned as much about him um, from the point of view that I did. Uh, again, I am by no means wishing my father's passing. I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of saying when he passed away and I did this documentary, I got to meet people from all walks of life, other family members, uh, community leaders, people in the industry, of course, fans. And I got stories from everyone. And I'm not sure I would have done this if he were still alive. And even if I'd become a mature adult and we'd had a lot of conversations, I'm sure I would have had a lot of wonderful conversations. And I'm glad, and, 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 I, and I wish he were alive so I could have had those. Um, but... I learned so much about him. Um, and it was, there was so much more to that documentary in terms of my experience than what came across on film. So, um, uh, for shock value, I said the positive side of him die, dying, truly, there was no positive side of him dying, but that is the silver lining, if you can say that about the experience. Oh, no, I totally understand what it is that you mean because, you know, you're looking at something where, you're getting kind of the unfiltered stories from people that they might not have been wanting to share, you know, and you're getting to see the real true story as, a, as you said, you know, people put him on a pedestal and I'm sure people that dealt with him on a professional basis did the same too. So you're always going to be kind of fighting that as you're trying to learn more uh, about who he was as a person. What do you find too is the most interesting thing about the way that those who worked with him come away from that experience. I mean, uh, you see a lot of people who talked about, you know, I talked with Walter Koenig, he talked about the very close relationship that the two of them had and, and a friendship that went beyond just, you know, uh, you know, creator, producer, and, and actor. Uh, well, uh, it, it is, it is interesting. That's a great question. I've never actually had that question before. I, I um, yeah. I, I don't know exactly how to answer that. I've, I've met, you know, people who truly loved him and respected him and, and appreciated his contributions and, and knew he was a flawed man, just like we all are flawed people, um, but still respected where he came from. Um, then there are people who, who I, I guess, didn't really agree with his, I'm, I'm thinking more on the professional side of things, so more in entertainment. My father was pretty strict in how Star Trek should be done. And uh, Mike Pillar, Michael Pillar, who was one of the producers, always told a great story. Unfortunately, we lost him a number of years ago as well. Um, he, he told a great story about how my father wouldn't let the writers work with traditional rules uh, in Star Trek. Uh, um, in Star Trek, you, you definitely need conflict is the big word they use. And he said, you can't have conflict between a crew of people who work in collaboration and at least, at least traditional conflict. Now, here I am saying this and Adam is actually the person who teaches film uh, to students. So, you know, I, I'd be very curious to his, his, hear his thoughts, but he forced writers to try to think of different ways to find conflict. It wasn't two actors or two characters arguing, fighting and shooting each other. I guess they had to create new ways of conflict where the story of a better future could still be told and, and an audience would still be engaged. So, you know, I, I, there are people out there who really didn't connect with that or agree with that and, uh, and, and just didn't buy into it. So I, it, it's just been interesting to meet all of those people. And I am really fascinated to hear what Adam has to say, not to put him on the spot, but. <laughs> You're on the spot now, Adam. Not, not at all, Ron. 
Well, I, Rob, we were actually talking about this earlier. I, I talked it because you've got these, you know, you've got Von Moore saying in, in Trek Nation that it was really difficult to work with your dad in those early years of the next generation because there was no conflict uh, in the future for him. Uh, and, uh, yep. you know, drama is based on conflict. And it, it wasn't until uh, they, they really moved on uh, after your dad passed away that they started to uh, and even uh, Rick Berman wanted to pay tribute and, and honor your dad's tradition. So it's very difficult for a writer uh, to create drama without conflict, uh, interpersonal conflict. Um, and I think it was, uh, and they were a lot, very difficult and very unhappy uh, with that kind of dictum uh, to have to work under. Uh, so that, that, I mean, that, that's pretty clearly documented. Um, that, I mean, it's, it's a great vision for the future, but it doesn't necessarily work as, as traditional entertainment. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's tough wrestling with that today as well in television. Yeah. Well, I was, I was going to say like now, you know, with, with the way that television has gone and, and you're working in it now, uh, Rod, with the series that are, that are out there and it's, it's different now, the way that things are presented now, everything has to be, uh, what's, what's kind of the, the way to put it, you know, th- the prestige level is up. You know, that every, every series that has come out, you know, and become one of those, uh, kind of tentpole shows has increased the prestige level for other things. So now people can get lofty with television series as opposed to in the, you know, the older days where they would say, Hey, you're just a TV show. You know, d- don't, don't take yourself so seriously. Yeah. Yeah. I, no, I mean, I, television today is, is a completely different animal on, on some level. Um, uh, again, I, I am not as, neck deep in it as some people might think but i'm certainly uh i'm certainly in it and um it's uh i i I love it when a new company comes along granted netflix isn't new anymore but i loved it when the when the the big players um all realized that there were these smaller companies like netflix coming out in hulu and uh, they were going to give them a run for their money because they weren't doing it the same old way and they were finding new medium new, new ways to get their content out there and I love the fact that this has electrified the entire entertainment market and, and really put everyone on notice. Uh, I would argue maybe there's too much out there right now with Quibi and all these things like that. But I'm getting older, so it's harder for me to keep up with that stuff. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited about the way things are changing. Because cause years ago, people would say, well, it's got to be done this way. And, and I'm sure, sure enough, I'm sure it had to be done that way because everyone was doing it that way. It's not being done that way anymore. You know, whether it's short form on YouTube or, or long, huge 15 episode story arcs, it's, it, it almost can be anything. And I love that. And, and, and it's really because of the blueprint that shows like Star Trek were able to place not only in the, you know, the storytelling aspect of it and, and the way that it brought some of those social issues to light, but also just in the fact that that was really one of those shows that proved that, okay, you have your run on the network, but then there's a lot to be said for what can happen in syndication afterwards. I know, you know, there were, there were other shows that came out that were in syndication, but none of them had the impact in that second part of its life like Star Trek did. There was no I Love Lucy and Honeymooners conventions that I know of, you know? Right, right. Well, I mean, it's just, it's just the show. I, 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 again, the difference between Star Trek and Star Wars. And again, I love Star Wars. Star Trek is more than just science fiction. It inspires people. It stays with people. It forces them to think. It forces them to look at other perspectives. People leave that show, whether they're kids or college students or whatever, and they continue the conversation because it proposed a question that, that made them think in a different way. And if you've got a show that can do that, you know, it, it's got legs. It's going to, it's going to, well, in theory, it's going to live on. And that's, I would say that's one of the main reasons why Star Trek has lived on. It, it makes you consider a perspective that you, you haven't really thought about before or see something in a new way or put yourself in a situation where you don't know which way you'd go because there is no necessarily right or wrong answer. Um, I, I love, I love the episodes. They don't all do that. Star Trek's not a winner all the way through. Sure. Um, but I love the episodes that really get you to, to question yourself, question what you would do, question what your beliefs are. Um, because a new point of view has been presented that, yeah, that kind of makes sense. 
Yeah, and, and, and I think that that's probably, you know, a sign of the times more than anything is, you know, Adam also referenced it too, that not every episode brings it up to this, to this, you know, this loftier level of, of storytelling. But at the same time, you have those, you know, at the time you had to have those episodes that are just kind of a good, you know, hour long adventure romp. You know, sometimes it's just going to be about landing on the strange planet and battling strange aliens. Sometimes it's going to be about, you know, uh, having some goofy fun, you know, that all of that is what kind of made the, the characters more human and, and gave them the kind of depth that they needed to be able to tell the deeper stories. Well, if I can jump in here a minute, Tim, I mean, uh, you know, and Rod talks about this in Trek Nation is that there, Star Trek offers, there's so much for everybody in the series. That's what's so interesting that there is some shows that are just adventure uh, type uh, uh, um, writing, you know, uh, uh, like with the Gorn on, on uh, uh, arena in that episode, there's, there's stuff that's there for the tech nerds to get into. There's stuff there for the science people to get into. There's stuff that's, that's really socially oriented for people to sink their teeth into. So, I mean, there's so many facets of the show that appeal to people on so many different levels. Um, there is some of it's just goofy and entertaining. And then we get people all the time. And I'm sure Rod's had the same experience about people in, in, in science, technology, in medicine, all saying, oh, well, we, we were inspired by Star Trek. We were inspired by Spock to go into this field. So it's so interesting to me that, that you know, depending on what your perspective is, Star Trek offers so, it's such a meal for so many different people with different perspectives. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's absolutely. That's one of the great lasting legacies of it is how many people, you know, how many astronauts were inspired by the show? How many people that work for NASA were inspired by the show? I've, I've interviewed actual NASA employees who have said, you know, if it wasn't for Star Trek, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. All the, the technology exactly. that we have, we can directly relate back to it, you know? Right. Yeah. And, and, and also, uh, Rod, too, that Star Trek has kind of afforded, you know, the Roddenberry family and, and yourself, especially to be able to kind of look forward with some other things as well, you know, looking at things like medicine and, and taking care of, of, of the, the oceans. I mean, we have the chance to see Star Trek's legacy and the name Roddenberry that can be attached to that kind of helping to make the world a better place in a tangible way. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, that's uh, on, on some level what we're doing with our family foundation. Um, that, that's, you know, I haven't, consider myself really a, a filmmaker or um, uh, not that knowledgeable about the entertainment industry. I've, I've dipped in and out of it and, and um, I, I kind of feel like uh, I, I'm not, um, it's not my area of expertise, um, but I'm still inspired by the Star Trek message. I still want to live in that future. Uh, do we need starships called the Enterprise? I'm not saying we need that, but the idea of uh, a future where we no longer fear the difference between us, but actually crave and desire the uniqueness in our galaxy. Uh, that sounds freaking amazing. Um, so, so the, our family foundation, we, we find organizations, institutions, and individuals that are working towards that long-term advancement of our species, no band-aid solution. Um, so whether it's technologies, methodologies, um, you, you name it, uh, people who are making significant change and impact to, to bring us that future. And and I, I don't want to gloss over the work that the foundation does. I mean, can you talk to us a little bit about the stem cell work that's being done? Well, you know, that, that's a, so the Roddenberry Foundation, we started 10 years ago, which is still relatively young for a foundation. Um, and we were pretty naive and we really thought we could change the world. And we ourselves can't change the world, but we realized we can partner up with larger agencies and groups that can. And uh, one of the first groups that we found was the Gladstone Institute, Institute in San Francisco. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd heard of stem cells, but I've only, I'd only heard of embryonic stem cells. Um, they introduced this to pluripotent stem cells, which I'm now just going to regurgitate what I've been told and learned over the years, but by no means am I an authority on it. Um, they, they, they pioneered uh, the idea, the, the ability to take any cell from the human body, a skin cell, uh, reverse engineer it into a stem cell and then program that stem cell to be almost any other cell in the body. So liver, heart, muscle, you name it. Uh, I think there are still some tissues that they can't do yet. But anyhow, so the, the implications are if they can grow, a sh so, so what we did is 
we, we spent nine months vetting them, and I took a tour of the facility, and I looked through a microscope, and I saw a sheet of beating heart cells, and they told me that came from an adult male skin cell. So the implication there is, you know, engineering organs, which was fantastic. And then what they introduced me to later, not just engineering, but testing drugs. For anyone with a heart condition, there can be, again, not a doctor, but uh, many different kinds of drugs that could help this person in their heart condition. Some could help and some could make it worse. Instead of testing the drugs on that person now, they could test it on these cells directly. They could get a skin cell and, and grow up cultures of, of heart cells and test these drugs on the cells and then find the one that's optimal for that person. So, so I mean, that is just incredible, radical change in the medical field. And, and I know there's a lot of uh, uh, institutions out there doing this, but we wanted to get behind them because they introduced us to it. Uh, we got along great with everyone there. And they also believe heavily in collaboration. They're not scientists who, who keep all their papers to themselves. They share all their papers to all the other institutions because they want to get, they want to find the solution. They don't need the credit. They want to find the solution. And so the minute I heard that and, and learned a little bit about what they did, we wanted to support them. I mean, that is, that is amazing. And, and, and I think out of anything that could be, I would, I would, that's probably one of the greatest discoveries of, of all of humankind for, for being able to, to, to not only save lives, but to save lives in a way where it doesn't cost lives to try to get to that point, uh, is it, something incredible. And if that ends up being the really long lasting legacy of Star Trek, I think that would be, uh, you know, something that, first of all, nobody would ever really predict, but everybody would say it's probably the most Star Trekian thing possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, yes. So organizations like that and people who are working to make the future a be a better, whether it's technology, methodology, those are the people that we support. And we talked a lot about it with Adam, and, and, and certainly we can continue discussing that too, but, you know, Star Trek for him was a, a family thing and f because he was there as it was happening. You know, he was seeing what it was like to be on the set. He was seeing the camaraderie amongst the cast. Uh, of course, you, you being born a little bit later, Rod, you didn't have that same... Uh, type of experience with the original series, but it was a family affair for you because your mom was heavily involved with the series as well. Uh, and, and it must be interesting for you to also know that, you know, you have fans, you know, there's, there's fans in the fandom that are just fans of your mom and her work as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been fascinating. Although, you know, I, I will just, just, I, I wasn't really that involved. Um, or, or, it's just, I really led my own life, uh, perhaps the privilege, but still my own life and didn't really, I don't, I don't mean to make myself sound that, that oblivious, but perhaps I just was, I, I knew Star Trek was there. I just didn't care. You know, when I was eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 and becoming a teenager, preteen uh, at friends at school, I did my own thing. I, I was a sci-fi fan in the sense that I watched Star Wars. But I just wasn't uh, just wasn't into it and pay attention to it and realize its, it's impact. So, so sure, when my parents had Star Trek celebrities over um, on occasion, they didn't really have that many. But still, you know, I I, I didn't really care that much. I, it just wasn't my thing. So sorry. <laughs> no, no, no problem at all. As I mentioned, I did eventually figure it out. I'm, I'm trying to read some questions that are coming in from all the listeners. Uh, and, and one of the things that came in is, uh, you know, Tracy says that Star Trek is what inspired her to become a biologist. So, I mean, we're seeing all That's of these awesome. comments of people, you know, that were inspired that by that. That is awesome. Now, I'm, I see that. And I think, I think in order for it to be Star Trek, it needs to be in, inspiring people. I, I'm sorry. If there's a Star Trek out there that's not inspiring people, it's, it's not Star Trek. She also has another question. I, I don't know how involved you were in this process, but I will ask you. She wants to know uh, if you know how they decided on Anson Mount for Captain Pike in Discovery. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of his. I, I loved his work on Hell on Wheels. I follow him on Twitter. You know, I think you, I think he answered one of my tweets once. And I geeked out. You know, he's he's just a fantastic yeah, I, choice. I, I don't know how. I apologize. I wasn't part of that process. Um, uh, but I I can't thank them enough. Um, his first few moments on the bridge of discovery, addressing the crew instantly elevated him to my second favorite Starfleet captain. Uh, Picard is my number one. 
Uh, I know everyone listening is going to boo me, and that's okay. Uh, Kirk has been knocked down to number three. Um, he might even be a bit lower than that. But uh, Anson Mount is now my second favorite captain because of his humility, but his charisma, his leadership skills, his ability to follow uh, uh, Starfleet's uh, protocol and break it when necessary. Um, he, he's uh, he's fantastic. And, and uh, as an actor, he's amazing. So I don't know how they got him, but I can't thank them enough for doing it. I, I am so happy that two of my favorite actors of all time both became uh, Starfleet captains. You know, I, I'm, I'm a big Anson Mount fan, and I'm a big Scott Bakula fan. So between the two of them... <laughs> You know, I had my geek out moment. Was that was that a good reaction or a bad reaction there? No, that was a great reaction. Okay. I, I actually, I, I haven't really seen, I watched the first season of Enterprise and uh, a second season lost me a bit. And I just haven't caught up, but I, I do a podcast called Trek Nation where we kind of go through every single episode chronologically. Uh, we've been doing it for seven years now. It's going to take 14 in total, depending on how many new series come out. And uh, it's just sort of a critical review of each episode and finding the morals, the myths, the meanings. Um, but I look forward to doing that with uh, Enterprise. And I did have the opportunity to meet um, Scott Bakula once. And he, he was the most kind, gracious person I, I had really met, I'd ever met. And people said that he was the kind of guy that after he'd be done with a take and he'd go over to a craft service table, if something fell on the ground, he would bend down and he would pick it up for someone. I mean, he, he was not, there was no ego at all. So he was just, so I really respect those kinds of people. Oh, I, I love it. And it's always good to hear good things about the people that you admire their work. Uh, now, so you said that you're going through every episode of every Star Trek series with this podcast? Every episode. We are, uh, we're just finishing up the fourth season of Deep Space Nine. We started with, of course, the original series, Cage, episode one, uh, moved into the animated series, which I'll tell you what, I, 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 I've told you how many ways I'm a fool already in terms of my knowledge of Star Trek. I'll tell you another one. I dismissed the, uh, animated series, um, in terms of it being worth my time to watch, uh, for a long time, just because the animation wasn't that good and, and I thought, how could a cartoon be Star Trek? But I finally watched it. And story-wise, it is, it is Star Trek. It is canon. The, the story messages, the stories make you think. They had an episode that, I don't want to give too much away, but it was about the devil. But it wasn't really the devil. It was a misunderstood alien creature that played tricks on people. Anyhow, it, it was thought-provoking. And so if you can get through the animation side of it, it is Star Trek. And I highly recommend watching it. Anyhow... That we did all of Next Generation. We broke up the movies in there because they, in terms of when they were released, and then we're with season four of Deep Space Nine, which I hadn't watched all the way through, and uh, I'm really starting to appreciate these 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 series that I haven't watched the full length of. So, what do you do when you have things that are concurrent? Uh, you know, when series are concurrent or movies are coming, do you just go back and forth between them, or do you have to wait until one season's over and then do something else? Well, if you're talking about Discovery and, and those shows that are out now, we have a live uh, show that we do, and that's, that's a call-in show. So when an episode of Discovery or Picard comes out, a few days later, our hosts get on the air and, 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 and invite questions, and then often we have a, a guest who's somehow related to Star Trek and, and talk about it. But the idea is we're leaving those for, unfortunately, seven or eight years from now, when we can look at them a little bit more objectively, look back at them objectively on the whole Star Trek timeline and say, you know, were these, were these episodes, did they stand the test of time? Did, did their message then, does it still relate today? How impactful was it then? Was there a message? Where does it fit in the Star Trek sort of ideology? And it's, it's, so they do it with, first of all, there's some, there's some trivia. There's a bit of humor that's thrown in. Um, but then it is sort of a good critical analysis of it. And uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Every time I listen to one of our episodes, there's something new that I missed in actually watching the episode. So uh, it's called Mission Log, if I haven't said it. Please, for those of you out there, check out Mission Log podcast. Um, give it a listen. And, and we'll put a link up on the uh, midnight.fm page for tonight's show as well. Uh, Adam, I'm going to put you on the spot. Have you watched every episode of Star Trek yourself? Of course. 
Tim, I mean, seriously? <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I laud I, I laud Rod for doing it. Uh, I, I have not seen every episode of Star Trek. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of it. I'm, I'm, I'm a big TNG fan. I'm a big Picard fan. Uh, I, I've watched a, a lot of Discovery. I agree about Anson Mount. I, I love him. Uh, you know, um, I, I love Ethan Peck as Spock. Frankly, I think he's terrific. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, I, you know, uh, and I love Sonequa. So, uh, you know, you know, the, the tradition goes on. It's not always, uh, for me, you know, Star Trek. I mean, there is some issue and, and I think Rob would agree, agree that we sometimes we have some issues to whether or not it really fits Star Trek canon, uh, when, uh, when we have all these spinoff series. Um, but, um, I've seen a lot of it and I enjoy it still. I mean, it is, you know, whether or not it inspires people and, uh, and it's a positive message for the future, which is something that we really need now. So, um, I haven't seen every episode, yeah. but, but Rob, that's amazing that you, you know, bit into that and are, are willing to hang on and, and continue to slog through it all. Cause it's just so much. It is a lot. It is a lot. And, and meanwhile, there's, there's people that are listening to this show right now that are saying, what are you complaining about? I've gone through everything four times already. No, yeah, you're right. I've, I've heard that too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, Absolutely. what, what has been kind of the one takeaway that you've had as you go through these and, and you're seeing the, 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 the nuances of each series and seeing the, the ways that, the different ways that things were handled. I mean, do you see how Star Trek has not only continued this, uh, you know, this vision for the future, but also becomes reflective of the times in which those particular episodes were made. It's really interesting you say that. I'm going to, I'm going to, if I can, if I can organize my thoughts, I'm going to try to answer two things on that. One is the, the thing that I, that I noticed that was really interesting. I watched the next generation when I was much younger. And then I watched it again, uh, uh for this podcast. And, the way I saw episodes then and the way I saw them now was, you know, there were definitely significant differences in what I was able to pick out of it. So, so I really found, I really found that, uh, incredibly fascinating. Um, uh, you know, I, I, well, I, I don't know if I have a second thought on that. I, I, watching it now, it, the sign of the time affected. Um, there's a deep space nine episode. I forget the name. Uh, the Bellevue riot. If you're a fan out there, you'll, you'll remember that episode. Um, Cisco goes back in time and it's, I think the mid nineties or something like that. And, and of course you're, you're in a, in a town and there's tons of poverty and racism and, 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 and the police don't care and the government doesn't care and they want to make everything sort of just disappear. And it culminates at the end with potentially the, the military or, or armed police coming in to clean everything up, you know, whatever, kill people if they needed to. And, and, and it's obviously concerning what we're going through today, which again, this isn't new today. We, we've had riots and we've had protests. It's just, it just takes years to culminate and these things need to happen because change hasn't happened. Um, but to watch that episode and then rewatch it again, right after all this has happened uh, is, you know, it, it's very poignant. It's very, People wrote about that, that they wrote that story back then because people were aware that people in communities were not happy with the way our system of government worked, with the way our local and federal system of government worked. Things weren't equal. Things weren't fair. Um, I, and here we are. Um, cause, cause we, we brushed things under the carpet for too long. We've ignored things too long. And by the way, I say we, I've got to include myself. I mean, I, I'm not, I can't just point to the government and say they're bad guys. I, I'm pro world, first of all, but because I live in America, I'm, I'm pro America. And as an American, we have let this go on too long. Um, so whether it's protesting or, or contributing money to programs that help or, or, or voicing your, uh, well thought out opinions online. And I want to emphasize well thought out opinions. Um, we all need to contribute. Well, I don't want to say people need to. If we feel we need to, we should all contribute in our own way. Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at, you know, where we needed to, where we need to get from where we are now, and I've talked about this quite a bit with not only Star Trek-related guests, but also with just 
guests in general on this program, that if we want to get to this society that we're supposed to be in the 23rd century, we have a lot of work that we need to do to get to that point because we're still fighting all, over all the little petty things as much as, you know, you're talking about the big picture things, of course, that we should be fighting about, but we can't even get on the same page, you know, about a lot of things. And, and, and we're, we're getting farther and farther away from where we need to be if we want to make that advancement. Of course, you know, first contact with an alien race would go a long way toward toward making some of those changes happen, but, you know, we can't rely on that either. We have to do a lot of this work ourselves. Well, I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, aliens kind of knew what was going on here and have been keeping their distance for a while until we mature up. Uh, I think that's in their best interest. Because, no, we're, I, listen, someone comes down here looking different than us, thinking different than us, telling us the universe works or might have a slightly different uh, plan than we think it does, uh, who knows what we'll do. So so I, I, as much as I want to meet aliens, I, I respect their decision to stay away from us right now. Well, Adam, you know that if the aliens do come down here, the first thing they're going to do when they encounter a human being is give the Vulcan salute, right? I hope so. <laughs> By the way, is, is, is it true that your dad came up with that? Uh, yeah, is. that is uh, uh, his background in uh, as uh, growing up a nice Jewish boy in the West End. Um, uh, it comes from uh, the symbol is uh, the letter Shin, which is, stands for uh, Shaddai, the Almighty, one of the many names for God in the Jewish tradition. Um, it is characteristic of the Kohanim, the priests uh, in the synagogue during the holiest day of the year to bless the congregation by making that symbol. You're not supposed to look at them while they're doing it. They're they're shrouded under their their talit, their prayer shawl. Uh, they're making the sign of the shin with their hands, both hands, as they're blessing the congregation. And and my dad uh, is fond of saying that when he was young, he 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 defied the rule and looked up to see what they were doing. And uh, he wanted to create something different uh, and unique and alien. Uh, when uh, he was uh, back home on. Uh, a month time back his planet Vulcan and the way that he interacted and uh, greeted um, um, some of the inhabitants of his uh, own planet. So uh, it was, it's one of his own inventions that he came up with on the, on the, uh, on the set as they were shooting. And, and, and now it's become an international symbol. I mean, you, you don't even really have to be a Star Trek fan to know it. And, and, and anytime anybody mentions it, you know, people do it. And, and Star Wars doesn't have that. Star Wars doesn't have a hand gesture. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Uh, well, there you go. <laughs> and, 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 and Rod, uh, one of the things that, um, last night we had an astrophysicist as our guest, Dr. Paul Sutter, and he was taking all of these huge concepts about the universe and the history of the universe and bringing it down to earth for us, pun intended, and kind of really breaking it down. And, and, and when I told him or when I mentioned on the air that, that the two of you were going to be the guests tonight, you know, he geeked out too because Star Trek was an influence in his life and got him going with what it is that he does. Now, uh, you know, Rod, your, your father was actually friends or, or, or at least corresponded with Isaac Asimov. Uh, Amy, who, who is, uh, the genius behind our program, I call her the, the, the Scotty, cause she makes everything run from the technical side of things. Uh, she said that, um, she was actually going through a box at the Asimov archive at Boston University, and the first thing she pulled out of that box was a letter between Asimov and your dad written on the letterhead from the first Star oh. Trek film. I, I need that. I, I will, so I have the other letter. So we, we've archived, uh, Almost, well, almost all, as much correspondence that my father's had with pretty much anyone. And we do have Isaac Asimov letters. I am very curious to find out. I'd love to be put in contact, and I will gladly share the digital uh, copies that we have if, if we can get to those. Because I want all this stuff to live in posterity. I want, I want to make sure that everyone has access to it. Well, I only live about 45 minutes away from Boston University, so anything that I can do to help to kind of set that up, I, I will certainly do so. And I'm sure Amy, if she has any contacts over there, can help out as well. We'll make that happen. Please. Great. But but that's that's what's so yeah, great you know, about My this. father was a... Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was just saying that my father, um, you know, I mean, that's another great thing about Star Trek that I think kept it on the air as long as it is. It, it was believable. Um in, in technology and and the, the way characters behave. But, I mean, as far as technology goes, uh, there's a great book called The Making of Star Trek by Stephen Whitfield, 
um, that that explains how my father would reach out to people at Caltech and JPL and 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 ask them what the next generation of technology was. And I can't I can't at this point. It's been so long since I've read the book. I don't know if I'm making this up or not. But there are things in it like I believe when my father was trying to figure out a, a non lethal weapon. He reached out to someone and they said, well, we have the laser, but we're working on the phasing laser. And that's sort of like where the phaser came from. So there's a lot of anecdotes in there about that. It was important that my father extrapolated or it got these technologies extrapolated so they'd be believable and weren't just, you know, X-ray guns or whatever. Um, so it's, 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 I'm very proud of him for keeping the science in Star Trek as believable as it could be, as believable as a as a forty two minute uh, uh, episode in the sixties could be. But it, it really. Uh, did. I don't think we're going to run into the Nazi planet anytime soon. But oh, I hope certain not. things you just have to let go. <laughs> I hope not. God, I hope <laughs> not. We've uh, we've got enough pro- trouble with uh, yeah. that on this planet. But I mean, yeah, exactly. You hear these scientists talk about it now. You know, the the younger generation of scientists, and, and they're saying, you know, directly that it was this. Star Trek vision that got them interested in this. You know, we, we talked about last night about interstellar travel and the possibilities of it. And, and all of the stuff that they're talking about is things that they first heard of, these concepts they first heard of coming from Star Trek. You know, this, this television show that was, you know, just trying to tell a good story each and every week was actually making sure that the, the science was there so that someday somebody would pick it apart and say, well, you know what, that actually, if it was going to happen, they'd be right. So that's, I mean, that's an astounding yeah. thing to, 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 to have be part of the legacy. Yeah, no, it's been very cyclical. You know, my father would pay attention to them and, and get ideas from them, and then years later people would say, uh, Star Trek inspired this technology. So it's, it's been a nice cyclical relationship. So now, as we're looking forward, we have the, the you know the final few moments here of of the program tonight, and I just want to read an email uh, that was sent in by uh, one of our regular listeners, Nancy. She says every night, at, you know, she watched Star Trek when it was on uh, the original series when it aired, and she said every night we watched Walter Cronkite showing us the horrors of Vietnam. It was horrifying to kids. Uh, she says that Adam, you and you and her are the same age. She said Star Trek changed their lives with hope. Hope that they gratefully gobbled up with its respect for all races and sexes. And if anything, that is probably the best part of, you know, what Star Trek meant is that it was a hopeful future. It was not dystopian. It was not, you know, the worst of humanity coming to light. It was, it represented the best of us and how the best of us could represent the rest of us throughout the course of the galaxy. And you said, El said, yeah. So with yeah. that with that said, you know, and as we were talking about the need to go forward, I will just I'll I'll let each of you uh Rod, we'll start with you. Just kind of give us, you know, just your kind of thoughts overall on the Star Trek legacy and what it's meant to you. For me it's it's uh, really always just been the backbone idea of IDIC. Uh for those of you who don't know, I D I C which stands for infinite diversity and infinite combination. Um uh, in, in, in the Star Trek future, there wasn't a crew going out seeking new and weird looking aliens. They were seeking different ideas, aliens who looked at the universe in a different way because we as a species had learned that it's the diversity between us and the diversity in our world, which that, that's how we grow. If everything were the same, we wouldn't grow. But the fact that we see different things and we hear different things and we learn different things that's how we intellectually evolve ourselves. And so in Star Trek, they were finding aliens who had a unique way of looking at the universe, and we knew that we could learn from their perspectives and incorporate them into ours. That is what we need to always be doing, whether it's in science fiction or every day. I'm on a soapbox right now. I, I, I can hear myself, of course. Nope, that's wrong uh, with that. It's not easy to do, to, to always have this philosophy, but it's okay to make mistakes, forget, and then just keep going. Um, we've we've got to keep appreciating everything that's different in our world. And, and Adam, yourself, just kind of what it's all meant to you uh, overall all these years. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, I, I agree with Rod. I just want to echo that because I think that's the big picture. That is really the forest from the trees is the fact that uh, 
despite where we are at, despite the conflict of what we are going through in history and working through, and that sometimes we, we fall back uh, and, and regress in, in our progress, uh, it's great to have an ideal to shoot for. Um, it's great to be, I mean, Star Trek is the future for us, uh, and the future that many of us want to have, uh, the vision that we want to maintain, uh, the vision that we want to strive for. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the fact is, I, I really do agree that the arc of history does bend towards justice, as uh, the Reverend Martin Luther King said. And I think that that's what Star Trek is. Um, it's like, folks, it's going to be okay. Uh, you know, don't give up hope. Uh, we need to work for it. It's a struggle. We need to earn it. Um, but it's there for us. It is an ideal that can be achieved. And uh, I really think that overall, that is the impact uh, that Star Trek has had on most people. Gentlemen, I thank you both for a fantastic night, for a, a night that I think will be something that all of our listeners w- cherish, and, and certainly they'll be going back and listening to this again and again. Thank you so much for helping to keep the Star Trek legacy alive, and all f- also for what you each do individually as well, and, uh, and hopefully you'll keep us up to date with all your projects in the future. Appreciate it, Tim. Rod, you. take care. Thank you, Adam. Take care, guys. All right, and everybody out there, that'll do it for tonight's show. We will be back tomorrow night, and uh, tomorrow we will be talking with Leslie Mitchell-Clark. We're going to be talking about hypnosis and high strangeness. Leslie Mitchell-Clark will discuss the use of skilled hypnotherapeutic regression and working with individuals who believe that they have had extraterrestrial and ultra-terrestrial contact and other experiences of high strangeness. So that's what's so great about this program, about Midnight Society. We can come at you one night from an astrophysics perspective, come in tonight with the, you know, the fictionalized version of the universe, as much as we all want it to be true with Star Trek, and then tomorrow night, kind of the, the dark underbelly of what's really going on out there in the cosmos with some of these extraterrestrials and what it is that they are doing to people. And I just want to let you know, too, that uh, later on in the week, we'll be talking with Peter Anthony, the accidental prophet. He is a near-death experience, re, uh, near-death experience experiencer, a numerologist and intuitive. He will tell us about how his near-death experience changed his vision of life and death. And then I, I'm going to just... Tell you that we'll talk more about Friday's show later because there's a lot of pronunciation that I need to learn before we can talk about that. But you will be able to find out all about that on the Midnight.fm Facebook page when you see the lineup for all of this week's shows. That'll do it for tonight. I just want to say an extra special thank you to producer Michelle tonight for pulling together this show, for getting Adam and Rod here on the program with us. It was such a pleasure to be able to not only interview the two of them and talk to the two of them, but to hear the and see the way that all of you out there in the audience responded to this. That's why we do this program. We want to bring you the people that you want to hear about, and I'm glad that you all responded the way that you had to this episode because it meant a lot to us, and we're glad that it meant a lot to you. That'll do it for tonight's show. Until tomorrow night, everybody out there, have a good night, and enjoy every sandwich. 